call to order the uh, select board meeting for Tuesday, September 24. Um, we were we just broke out of executive session, um, and now we are in public session. Before I do the Pledge of Allegiance, I want everybody here to know um, Bill's Pizza is not a parking lot for here. They have tow trucks on the way. He's very, I just got a text from him. He's very angry that, that his lot has got 60 cars in it and 15 customers in the building. So they're going to tow your car if, if you're out there. So I would, uh, I would strongly suggest to move. You park on the street, park up at the church. Library. Um, Library. Are you going to give us a chance to go move cars? Yeah, we're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance. I'll do it slowly. Uh, before we <laughs> park the community center, though, right? The community center. The last half of the block? No. No, no that's, the, that's, the, that's uh, the Masons and the Bank. No, 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 the bank. no you cannot. No. No. We, we, have, we, have, four, we have four spaces for, for Town Hall. So yeah, the control booth is a park beyond the bank. Beyond the bank, you who, said. Who, who told you that? Yeah, then that's between you and Bill's. Yeah. Well, may I also say, yeah. if I could add, that that gentleman's correct, yeah. that they do not own behind the Masons. Okay. And see, that they don't mind people parking. Yeah. And when I say that about the, about Bill's, they have, I don't find that to be out, out of question. I know that there's been times where people come in to use their 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 facility, get get food, and they can't go there. But as a Freemason, I've got to say that uh, Tuesdays are the Masons' meeting nights. So all right. they will also tow to make sure they get the people in the meetings. And now we'll do the so, Pledge of Allegiance. So, okay. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. So as we do for every um, kickoff of every meeting, we're going to have public session. Mm -hmm. Looks like we have a pretty uh, vibrant, vibrant group here. Um, you have two minutes. We're not going to have any back and forth. You're not going to get any for this public comment. You can come up and say whatever you want within reason. You're not going to get any feedback from us. We're simply going to say thank you. Um, so I would ask, though, in the sake of time, uh, time, that if everybody is here to tell us that we should drain the water from the lakes, uh, you know, uh, we understand that. We, we know that you guys are, we knew that you guys were coming up here for that and, and we're okay with that. Don't get in a rut where you're repeating the same thing. Mr. Chair. Yes. As we did last meeting, uh, someone spoke about an issue and that was it. There was no dialogue because it's not posted in the agenda. So it's illegal for us to have a debate about something that's not posted in the agenda. That's why we can't respond. But then later in the meeting, based on some feedback, we asked for a future agenda item to address something that came up that night. Yep. So there's a way to get something on the agenda, but it's not in this first five minute segment. So everybody's yep. clear. Yep. So that said, is there anyone here that would like to uh, come up and share their ideas, opinions, or ask questions regarding town government? May I please? You may. Come up and tell us who you are, where you live, and hold on, let me get my stopwatch. <laughs> I am Cynthia Estheimer. I live at 118 Hayward Street, and I am a member, I wrote it down to be quick, member of the Lake Bass Pinock Weed Management and Control Advisory Group. I'm also a Lake resident and um, a member of the Lake Association here, but tonight just want to focus on a couple of points uh, from the point of view of the advisory committee. Uh, we did have an abundance of nuisance weeds this past season, enough to affect recreation and boat access to one portion of the lake. And the advisory group performed a couple of surveys, and we do see that treatment of some kind would improve conditions for the lake next season. The advisory group has identified three treatment options for that area. The preferred method is the, has been very effective in the past, and it's an extended drawdown that lasts for a number of weeks. And there's no cost involved with that. Mechanical harvesting is our designated number two option for that area. Uh, it has a big price tag, and there are all kinds of complications with 
with looking at that as an option. The third option is the use of herbicides as directed by the select board. We would need to hold a public forum to discuss the use of an herbicide. So the herbicide application does have a lower price tag. So with the high cost of mechanical harvesting and the controversy about herbicides, voters may not approve either of those two options and we'd have a yet another uh, difficult season next year. So we were not able to do an extended drawdown last year and cannot this year because one family as well has run dry in the past. A solution would be Five to, seconds. to create a permanent water supply, but the town cannot pay for any improvement. Thank you. So that's our best tool is the extended drawdown, but thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next. Okay. My name is Dave Gibbs. I live on Crockett Road. Let's see. So, I don't want to just have just one quick comment in terms of uh, the extended drawdown. In this, one quick comment in terms of uh, one comment that was made in terms of a resident losing their water, that has never been ver uh, verified. Um, we have no evidence at all that they've ever lost their water. Uh, I've been involved with the weed study committee for a number of years. My wife says too long. Um, but for th three attempts, two attempts, I worked directly with that family. Um, and uh, rest assured that if there was anything happening with that family, I would have had a phone call as I did one night at 9.30 in the evening. So in terms of losing the water, I think that's important for everyone to understand, the, the, the people that are behind me and, and also for the select board, that's unverified. And, and the extended drawdown has been successful over the years. Um, there's a person who's gonna make a presentation tonight on what, he, what we've researched as a point well. I think it's important for the select board to, to hear that. I think it's also important for the select board to see the pictures that were taken of, of one particular weed, the large leaf pond weed, which is the most invasive weed and the most problematic weed that uh, affects people along that whole North Basin. Uh, in terms of herbicides, I think it's also important for people to understand that I think everyone's in agreement use herbicides as a last resort. And as Cynthia did point out, the drawdown has been ex effective in the past. So I think what we're looking for first and foremost, with, without getting into herbicides, is support from the select board, support from Board of Health, which I think we've got some support from Board of Health and CONCOM to execute an extended drawdown. Thank you. So. Come on. charge your time for setting up. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for having me. My name's Rick Marino and um, I live at 97 Crockett Road. Um, I just wanted to make this real quick. Um, I know everybody's uh, busy, but this here basically, um, I know the lighting isn't phenomenal, but as you can see here, this is a photo taken this morning of the lake. This is in six feet of water and you can see how the weeds are all the way up to the top. Um, you have houses over here, and this is just like non-swimmable. Um, these are uh, photos taken right from a small boat. All the, again, these are all in six feet of water. So that's just to give you just a quick synopsis of what we're up against. Uh, Dave, if you can move the board next. Okay, so here is our holdup on the drawdown. Um, basically, this is the home that's here um, on the island, and they're the one that has, they have a shallow well. Um, if you look at this, uh, this uh, site map here, the residence is here. There's a little white speck right here to the right. That's where their well is. It's on the shallow, uh, it's right alongside the shoreline. 
Um, this is a pic, you can see their house in the distance. This is the cement wall that they've built. This is another view of it. And right in here is where their wellhead is. This is a close up view. If you see this brick right here, again, this is the brick and zoomed in. That's their wellhead right there, which is basically just a hand dug shallow well five feet deep right alongside the water's edge. So they're using non-potable water for their residents. Our plan is uh, this, there is really difficult access to this here, but our plan is to drive what's called a uh, sand-driven point well right down through the middle of their existing well so that it won't run dry when the lake gets drawn down past five feet. Uh, we, we're, uh, we need to get this point down at least another six to 12 feet, however far we can get it down to resolve this issue. Um, this would be considered a well repair, exist, you know, repair existing well. Doesn't require a ton of engineering. Um, in the event that we cannot get this uh, and we find rock, when we find rock, we'll try to drill through the rock. But if it's ledge, we want to be able to relocate this within a six to eight foot um, diameter outside of their well. You gotta and, sum it up, buddy. I've already given you more time. Yeah, so anyways, that, that's our plan, and that's really what we're looking to do. So we're, uh, we, I just wanted to clue everybody in on it so that everybody's in understanding of what's going on. Thanks. Thank you. Just, just one clarification. So while this plan is being executed, the key is what we're, we're looking for support from this board and, and, uh, and other boards is that to approve an extended drawdown while this process, this process could be completed in as little as three weeks if nothing is problematic, but so that we don't lose another season with the weeds, yep. we're looking for support for extended drawdown with the caveat that if in fact there is evidence that they lost their water, we would stop the drawdown immediately, provide compensation for them for alternative housing while the lake regenerates itself and any water inconveniences they would have. So we've got a contingency plan as a last resort to do that for these people. Um, we've been working with Norman, our apologies that we haven't been able to talk with you about this because of the so that's so again, not to, not, I don't want to sound aloof like I'm, I'm not listening to what you're saying. And I, there's so many things I'd like to say, but like Mr. Hurst said, I'm not allowed okay. to. I've been swimming in that lake a lot longer than probably 100% of these people have been, been in Hopkinton. So I get it, but I just can't comment on it. We're going to leave these with them Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Good. Beth? This is a plea to save the town common. The yeah. Hopkinton's... Name and address. Pardon? Name and address. Oh, Beth Kelly, 5 Ash Street. The Hopkinton Center Historic District Commission is a seven-member commission appointed by the select board. It is the reviewing authority responsible for regulating design within the Hopkinton Historic District. Historic districts in Massachusetts have as a major proposal, as stated in Chapter 40C of the Massachusetts General Laws, quote, to preserve and protect the distinctive characteristics of buildings and places significant to the history of the Commonwealth and its cities and towns. At the present time, it becomes necessary to protect the town common, which lies within the Hopkinton Historic District. Proposed design changes will forever change the town common's historic appearance. Please attend a Historic District Commission public hearing on October 10th at 7 o'clock at the Senior Center to voice your concerns about the proposed changes. Please save our town comment. Thank you, Beth. Next. Yep. Yes, hi, Walter Garland, uh, 50 Downey Street. Uh, just to add on uh, to the issue with the weeds, 
Uh, we have a home in the North Basin uh, on the east side of the lake. Uh, we've, we've lived on the lake for like six years, and uh, this is the worst it's ever been. Uh, the extended drawdowns have helped significantly in the past. We missed the extended drawdown last year because of this same issue and it wasn't resolved. Uh, I would spend, I would say, at least four to five hours every weekend this past summer uh, just raking in weeds that had been churned up by boats going in the North Basin. Uh, and it, it, I would have weeds this deep uh, just floating on the surface 15 feet out into the water all the way across my entire property. And it, it's just unacceptable because you can't, you cannot enjoy the lake. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is, it's being ruined by these weeds and we have this ex excellent option with the extended drawdown and we should be able to use it. Uh, and it, it's just not fair that one family is holding 17,000 residents of the town hostage essentially to not enjoy our lake. Uh, my jet skis got clogged up multiple times, boat propellers jammed up. I, all my neighbors experienced the same thing. This, something has to be done. So we really appeal to you to help us uh, accomplish this extended drawdown. I mean, the only other choice is herbicides. And the extended drawdowns have worked. So we ask for your support in, in trying to make that happen. We only have a short time frame before uh, it, it, we're not going to be able to do the extended drawdown. So yep. whatever you can do, we would appreciate your help. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Jamie Gonsalves, uh, 92 Downey Street. I'm a member of the LMPA Executive Board as well as a member of the uh, I can't remember the exact name of the weed committee, the citizen input team. As you've heard tonight, the weeds have been a problem for a long time. We've been dealing with this issue for a number of years. The weed committee's been in, involved with assessing the issue over a long period of time. We've come to a stumbling block. We really have. We're, we're thwarted at every turn when it comes to getting the extended drawdown done for a number of issues. And I encourage the select board, town, administration to sit down with the LMPA and with the one resident um, that is, has the issue so we can come to a resolution. Because right now, as it stands, there's a number of issues that we can't talk with them. They'll talk to the town. The town will talk to the, to the LMPA. The town can't spend money. The LMPA has the ability to do that. But we have to go to our, our members to get approval for that. And so it's kind of a circular process here. So we need to sit down and come to a resolution on this. And I really encourage us that we get on the agenda to discuss this and have it, have it come to an, an understanding of what needs to get done. Because right now, it's completely unacceptable. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Hey. Patty Holland, 207 West Main Street. I'm going to read off my paper because I don't like speaking in public. <laughs> Uh, I live on the north side of Lake Massimonoc. I know that you are aware our beautiful lake has been totally inundated by longleaf pond weeds and snails on the north side this summer. I've lived on the lake for 13 years, and this is the worst I've seen the weed infestation. I wrote you all earlier in August of our dilemma with our brand new boat, getting stuck trying to help someone in distress. We've witnessed many jet skis and boats having the same problem throughout the summer, and unfortunately, we were not able to assist them because we didn't want anything happening to our boat. The north end of the lake has become totally impassable for us, as each time we took our boat out, we had to dock it and spend 20 to 30 minutes unclogging the weeds from our engine. I can't imagine this is good for a new motor, and our time on the lake became limited because of this. We pay premium taxes here on the lake, and one of the other things I'm concerned with is our property values declining if nothing is done again this fall and spring. I have attended the recent town meetings, and although it seems encouraging, 
I want to express to you our problem so that you can understand how this is impacting our end of the lake and our quality of life living here. Last fall, nothing was done and the lake residents suffered the consequences of no actions taken. We implore you to find a solution. My husband and I are in full support of the extended drawdown and, if necessary, the application of herbicides to eradicate this issue. Please do not let another fall and spring pass by without taking any actions to help. The fate and future of the lake is ultimately in your hands. And I know that I speak for my entire lake community when I say, please support the recommendations of the Town Weed Advisory Committee as they have been researching and preparing solutions for the past few years. Thank you for your Thank time. You. You're up. Uh, my name is Michael Riley, uh, 201 West Main Street. Uh, I was originally on the uh, dam committee that was, we purchased the dam, and Brian, I think you're the only one, and Norman was the only one that's left. Um, this, I guess my frustration is three years ago we decided to get a committee together because we, we came in about the herbicides. So we're three years into it. The weed advisory committee comes up with options, and they say, where are some things that we can do, however. It doesn't get done. The herbicide has been an option. I, I, I think having Spindle Island is one thing, it's a private citizen, it's a tough thing, but I want to go a step further and say, we have a plan, we have a, one that was approved by the Weed Committee and it seems to be stalled because for whatever reason they don't want to use herbicides. They could spot treat for a small amount of money and eliminate the problem or the need to have one, one person go there. Uh, one person's uh, well added at personal cost to everybody on the lake to fess up. I think we should need to go and say, why hasn't there been an action for three years from this committee that was formed, has come up with a solution, and yet their hands are tied to actually come up with a, anything. Yes, the drawdown's great, but we're being stopped there, so why can't we go to plan B? No one will give an answer. There's, according to what the order conditions are, there's supposed to be an answer supplied uh, with solutions. They came up with solutions and the weed committee isn't being listened to. So I'm, I'm asking that you actually listen to the weed committee. That's great if we can do extended drawdown, but they, they made a recommendation also to do herbicides and it's like the, un, the words nobody wants to hear in this town. Bottom line is we now have evidence that a lot of things that were brought up three years ago weren't true. In other towns, we do, why don't we rely on what Natick did? Why don't we rely on what Framingham did? Or dozens of other towns that have been using this herbicide for years. Instead, we sit back and do nothing. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Sabine? I mean, young lady. <laughs> Sabine, St. Pierre, One Woody Island Road. So I think you get the picture of where we're at. Um, the one picture I think that hasn't been painted is the amount of time and effort that has gone into this over the last three, four years from numerous committees. Everybody involved, and especially the advisory, advisory committee that was put together has spent endless, countless hours. The LMPA, we spent endless, countless hours trying to work on this. So I just hope that we understand how much time and effort and all the committee meetings we've been going to and just trying to get our voices heard and get our hands untied in this. Um, so I just, I hope everyone really understands. Um, they're all volunteers, <laughs> you know, like a lot of people are in these committees. Um, so I think you get that, but I just want to make sure that everyone really sees that picture as well. Thanks. All right. Is that it? Anyone else? Good, seeing none. Thank you very much. So moving forward, our next item on the agenda is, and, and uh, again, thank you very much for coming up and, and uh, voicing your concerns. Uh, like, like Mr. Hurst said, and I said already, it's, it's illegal for us to put our own spin on it, and our own opinion and our comments, so. Um, Mr. Chair, I will have a suggestion for future agenda items in about an hour or so. Can't wait, Mr. Hurst. <laughs> okay. I think I'll second that one. All right. Maybe two hours, but Mr. Chair, with your permission, uh, may we take item two out of order? 
I understand uh, Pastor Mike has an appointment at 7. Yes, we certainly can. So you want to jump right to the 26.2 Foundation update? Mr. Kilduff, are you ready? We're ready. You are always ready. <laughs> I'll give you two and a half minutes. <laughs> Uh, Tim Kilduff, I'm at, uh, I live at uh, 3 Woodview Way here in Hopkinton. Been a resident for a while. But uh, You're a town resident? I am a town resident, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the, this select board has been, um, I think, rather patient over the last few years with uh, the 26.2 Foundation as it relates to some of the work that we do in the, in the big vision that we have. Uh, for developing an international marathon center. So we thank you for that patience. Uh, we understand that uh, that patience, along with that patience, comes faith uh, that we'll continue to work uh, towards uh, the big vision. Uh, and uh, Mike Lawrence, who's a senior pastor at uh, the Faith Community Church, and Joe Baldiga, who's a partner in the distinguished law firm of Miracle Connell, are here to uh, share some pretty exciting news. Can't wait. Well, thank you very much. My name is Mike Lawrence, 43 North Street, representative of the 26.2 Foundation Board. I want to thank the Select Board for the support that you've given us over the years, especially the IMC vision. We have some exciting news about the IMC. Uh, we have been recognized as the, by the Boston Athletic Association as a, in their community partner program. As a recognized nonprofit, we'll be receiving an additional 50 bibs for the next two years. We've uh, distributed in a memorandum. Have you received the memorandum describing the bibs and their use? So in that memorandum that's outlined, it describes how the bibs will be used and how they'll be monitored. We're excited because we think that this is gonna benefit the whole town, not just in advancing our mission, but in the reputation of the community and its economy. And as a representative of the board, we just wanna publicly thank everyone for your support, especially the board's BAA liaison, John Catino, who's worked tirelessly in helping us with the community and uh, the BAA and the 26.2 Foundation to advance the IMC. This is exciting to see it moving from vision into reality. By the end of the year, we'll be issuing a response for the RFP on the land down the end of the street, which will detail how the IMC will be used and uh, our plans for that for the future. Is there any questions in regards to the memorandum that uh, we distributed on the use of the bibs and its finances or any supervision? Okay. Mr. Chair. Through you, Mr. Hurst. So to be clear, these additional 50 numbers, which is great, and that's a serious, valuable commodity, if you will, um, are going to be distributed by the 26.2 Foundation and do not impact the town's allotment of numbers that we get from the BAA that we will do a separate process for. Correct. Right. Those 50 bibs come directly from the BAA to the 26.2 Foundation. Yep. That's right. awesome. That really the town is. Town continues to get the, the full allotment as yeah. well as the, as well as, uh, uh, the uh, cross point and the investment uh, center. Excellent. Mr. Chairman, the, uh, the, the, just to add a, just a little footnote, uh, the BAA values each individual entries at ten thousand uh, dollars. Now you just go out, just don't go out and recruit people overnight yeah. to fill those numbers. It's a, it's a serious amount of work, uh, but you can uh, do the math. The potential here is pretty serious. Uh, the objective is to whatever we do uh, with the funds is to set this up so it's a benefit to Hopkinton. That's absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we, the money gets uh, uh, put towards building the entryway into, the, into that piece of property down on East Main Street, uh, or if there's additional property uh, purchased, and if, for example, and I don't think this will happen, the International Marathon Center is not built, that'll refer back to the town. Okay. So uh, in the work that uh, uh, John Catino and, and, uh, and others have done, we've made that very clear. That's the single strongest factor uh, in the BA's decision to give this gift. Uh, and they, don't, they just don't add these kinds of numbers uh, to their entries, I'm sure you know, Mr. Hur. 
So it's nice to see, it must be nice for you to see all these 40 so years of hard work start to come <laughs> to fruition. I know that you like to sit up there and deflect the credit to other people and to the BAA and to the board members, but really it's you. And uh, as, the, as the chair of the board and as a longtime um, resident of Hopkins, I'd like to say thank you for all the work that you're doing and the passion that you bring to it. And I know I love how uncomfortable you are taking the accolades. I love making you uncomfortable up there. So <laughs> I, I appreciate that. And it, 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 that. That's nice to hear. Thank you very much. But again, let me just, I can't walk away without saying that we would not be where we're at. We would not be able to make this announcement if it weren't for the collaboration, cooperation, the alliance that's been created between the BAA, the town, and the 26.2 fund issue. Uh, and I'd also be remiss if I didn't point out that, that uh, uh, the former uh, selectman at that point, Lenny Holden, is also on our board, and I think Bruce McDonald, who is uh, on our board of directors, is here as well. Again, deflect. This is this is a you know what this is a, this is a big deal. Listen, an arrow is no good if it yeah, doesn't help you. if it doesn't have a tip. Tim had nothing to do with this. <laughs> There's all these other guys. Yeah. This is a yeah. this is a big deal. I don't know why he's good. Talking. All right. Mr. Chairman, we were at the board. We affirm your affirmation of Tim's involvement. Without his driving energy, this wouldn't be where it's at. And without the driving energy of the BAA liaison, we wouldn't be here talking about this and thanking you for your help. Special liaison. Well, it, 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 no, it truly is. It truly is an alliance, and that, and that's that, that's what I was trying to bring to the BAA over the last uh, four years, is that. Um, Working, working with the 26.2 Foundation, or what used to be the Hopkins Athletic Association, as well as the town, oh, that uh, we could do great things together, and and that's what they finally got to see is that uh, we're all working for the same cause, to um, elevate the uh, the Boston Marathon, to elevate the, the town of Hopkinton, and to to make it a great place to live and work and play. Mary Jo, anything for these guys? I can say no. guys. <laughs> okay. Perfect. I've been reading. Our friend. Oh. I waited till you got a big bug. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I, all I can do is echo what uh, what everyone else has said. But Tim, uh, you're the driving force, and you've uh, made this happen. You have a great team around you. It's fabulous. Um, hats off. I mean, this is this is truly impressive. This is a big deal. Great job, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Now, now the work starts. Yeah, get to it. You're not getting anything done sitting here talking to us. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Fifty numbers. That's awesome. Yeah, that is awesome. So nice job. Yeah, excellent job to all involved. So how are we doing here? We are. You want to go to the Hopkins Garden Club? We got Abby number one. Is Abby? She's here. Yeah. She's here. Okay. So why don't we start with the uh, before we do the Hopkins Garden Club? Why don't we go back to the Mental Health Collaborative and Hopkins Youth Family Services Community Survey Update. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello. Hi. Um, I'm Abby Rosenberg, 149 Wood Street. Thank you for having us here. Um, I know many of you from my work with the Sharon Timlin Memorial event, but I'm here tonight <coughs> to talk about a new nonprofit that I recently started. It's called Mental Health Collaborative, and our mission is building resilient communities through education and awareness. Um, just quickly, I know we're rushed here. My background is as a psychiatric nurse practitioner and a psychotherapist, and I've um, worked in private practice and on college campuses doing therapy and medication support for about the last 30 years or so. Um, and you did do the math correctly. I started at age 10. <laughs> I think you're on too much of your own depicot. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Mental Health Collaborative was sparked by a former patient of mine who lost his life um, and died by suicide. And that's what prompted me to start this. Um, I lost my train of thought, sorry. Um, anyway, I've just become more and more aware of the need for mental health education, and awareness, and community building, and that's really why I'm doing this. Um, our core program, and I'm, it's, I don't know if it's okay to leave some of these cards here. Absolutely. But our core program is based on mental health literacy. So really, just like we 
teach people and expect people to know math literacy, overall health literacy. Mental health literacy is also crucial and critical. Um, so we're piloting our program beginning in Hopkinton at no charge. Um, we are funding a program called Challenge Success in the high school beginning this fall. And we are working with the uh, middle school and high school on piloting some mental health curriculum programs beginning in the spring and we'll um, hopefully do community-based program programs if they're wanted in the community. And our, our goal, Mental Health Collaborative, our goal is to eventually grow into neighboring towns as well. Um, and just the, the another initiative and the reason that I'm here with Dawn tonight is um, we're also doing a community, a mental health community needs assessment and um, our goal is to use that information to, um, you know, guide some of our programming and really have an idea of what's important to our community in regards to mental health. Um, so the survey is currently online mm -hmm. until October 5th, so there's about 10 days left. Um, and I'd love to ask you to offer any help you can in supporting and maximizing the participants in Hopkinton. Um, so it's open to people ages 18 and up. We're collaborating with Hopkinton Youth and Family Services to do this and with Boston Research Group. So it's anonymous, takes less than 10 minutes, and I would just love as many people as possible to, to give us information as to what they need and where they feel the gaps are in regards to mental health. So, any questions? And I think Don wants to talk about another initiative too. Sure. Thank you, Don. Uh, uh, Don, before you start, does the board have any questions? I have a question, Mr. Mr. Her? Abby, the survey has um, EHOP through their communications channel. Have they notified their uh, constituents? Yes. You call them, but they're, yes. It's, it's online. Yeah, we've had a lot of support with HCAM, um, EHOP, uh, just social media, right. just trying to get the word out. It's hard. People are so busy. It's hard. I have some surveys at the Hopkinton Senior Center, and um, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. And at Family Day. Yes, we were there, it was fun. I want to contact the Women's Club when they do their phone book each year. Put the information in the Women's Club phone book. Um, I'm sorry, I don't. The Hopkinton Women's Club puts out a phone book for the town every yes. year and it lists a lot of things. And uh, I think that this is the kind of line that should be in that phone book. As an it's organization, local. there's a list of organizations. Oh, as an organization, yes. yes. Yeah, because we are going to base, be based in Hopkinton and, um, so I can contact them. All right, Don, you're up. Okay. So I'm Don Alcott, I'm the Director of Youth and Family Services, and, and just what an honor and pleasure to collaborate with Abby. Um, I think it's a wonderful thing when a resident um, comes forward in this way to do something for their community when they didn't have to. And um, so I, I applaud her and her efforts um, to serve the community in this way, and we'll certainly glean a lot from the data about what we can do for youth and family services um, here um, in Hopkinton and for the residents in Hopkinton and how we can partner together. Um, there's more than enough to go around in terms of mental health need. And so um, I look forward to this journey forward. So I'm here tonight to share with you about the Interface Helpline. Um, Hopkinton Organizing for Prevention is a substance misuse prevention coalition coordinated through Hopkinton Youth and Families, started by Denise Hildreth when she was here, and funded for a very long time through earmarks through um, Senate, Senate, Pre Senate President Spilka's office. And we're so grateful for, for those funds because um, they've been able to fund different programs within the community around substance use awareness, but what we kept hearing back is that access to treatment is so very difficult, not just for substance use, but for mental health, which is inextricably linked. And so the Interface Helpline is a response to that. It's a contract that was entered into with William James College. Um, when a family calls for either a minor or for a person for themselves, um, they reach a counselor on the other end, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. Um, who can help them navigate the mental health system. So if somebody needs an outpatient mental health appointment and they call, they give their story once 
instead of multiple times on a check, like you, you go to the doctor and they tell you, I think you need to see a counselor, and they hand you a sheet and out the door you go and you call everyone on the list. And they say, well, we don't take your insurance, or we're not taking new patients, or we don't. And we were hearing this from families over and over about the struggle. And this eliminates that struggle for the families. Um, they give their story one time to the counselor on the end of the phone, who then finds a specialized match according to their insurance, their need, their reason for calling, and explores things with them further um, and, and helps them find the right fit. And so the better information somebody gives to them, the better match they make. And they have um, up to two weeks to provide three matches. So sometimes they might get a call back the next day with, we found one match for you. We're still exploring other options, but you can get started. And families will then interview um, that, that provider. They'll call and be sure, eh, that's not the right fit for me. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, you don't need to give me the others. I found my person. And so um, they'll work with somebody, even if they try all three matches and it's just not a good fit, they'll go back to the drawing board with them again. Um, and so it's, we have entered into a two-year contract um, and we're, we get really good data back about the issues that folks call about. So um, oftentimes somebody might call with like anxiety, depression, and marital problems. And so they'll have a way to, to categorize that and give good data back to the community about what the most pressing issues are. And it's a great thing for providers as well because they can register with Interface and get specialty referrals instead of getting a lot of phone calls of folks that they would never treat, that they don't have the credentials to treat or the experience to treat. So it helps them on their side too. So we've worked to reach out um, to providers to be sure they're registered. And um, so I'm wondering if you have any questions. Board members? No, I, I, think, it's, I think it's great that, you know, that it's, it's one of those things, my, my, my wife being a physician, whenever somebody in my, in, that in my family got, got sick or had to go to the ER, or even in my neighborhood, we get a lot of those calls. So we found them broke the leg. Can you, can you clear a path for them? So she calls ahead to the ER to make sure that there's somebody ready to take them on, what's going on, blood pressure, all that kind of stuff. And to have an ombudsman, especially for mental health issues, it's even, it's even uh, uh, more important because of the, the stress that's involved and, and, the, uh, and the pitfalls that you can run into. So it, it's, a, it's a great uh, uh, thing that you're starting. Thank you very much. Um, we put together cards. The Hop Coalition, they worked hard over the summer. We had members that put together resource cards that we'd like to get in the hands of every resident um, in the community. And so on one side of the card are, are resources. You know, maybe it's not nine to five that you've decided you want to act on a problem. And you feel really alone on a weekend and you're thinking, well, I can't. I don't know that I can survive to wait till Monday at nine to make a phone call about my mental health need. There are a ton of resources that are 24-hour resources on the back where somebody can call and get the support they need and they don't have to wait. And then when they're ready, they can call the Interface Helpline to find their outpatient services. Um, and then um, on the other side, it's, it's information about Interface and about how to access them. And, and on their website, which there's a link to on the card, there's just a host of information about what expectations are when you go to a mental health appointment and, and to decrease the anxiety and stress around taking that very important first step. So I just want to make you aware of these. I'll leave some here for you. Excellent. Thank um, you. And then um, I'd like to just hand them back so sure. folks can each take one. If, if they don't need them, they might run across somebody who does. Yep. Um, and just throw it in a drawer. You never know who you might talk to that you can hand it to. So <laughs> I just right. want to also say that um, this is a huge need um, being in the mental health field. And when I, I've been researching for over a year what I wanted to do to, to make some impact. And the two issues were uh, accessing mental health care, which is a huge, huge problem, as well as increasing education and awareness and destigmatizing, which is what I, I hope our organization does. But I think it's, it's just invaluable to our town to have this service. So uh, de doing the destigmatizing, <coughs> So I work in the uh, prison system, and I know that uh, a few years ago we had five corrections officers commit suicide on duty, and uh, the, the um, gist of that occupation has always been kind of testosterone driven and too cool to get counseling, and uh, having been in the prison system now for seven or eight years, uh, that in itself has changed where you know the EAP has been become very prevalent, the union has jumped in, and the, um, the corrections officers themselves are 
seeing that there's some mental health issues and they're seeking help. So, uh, you know, that, that, that stigma, um, they equate it, you know, listening to the CEOs there at, the work, at work, they'll, they'll say, going to my first mental health appointment is like going, the first day going to the gym. It's uh, humbling and, and, you know, you get to swallow your pride and go in and then, but <clears throat> the options are not good. So you're doing a great thing, and thank you very much. Mr. Hurt. <coughs> um, so, Dawn, obviously you're new in the job, newer in the job. Uh, how long have you been in the job now? Since April, the end of April. Since April, so just a few months, and you've already hooked up with Abby, who's a major driver in the community for all kinds of good things. So good for you. It's obvious you're doing a good job. You hooked up with Abby like that. That's great. Um, but how's the job for you going in general so far while you're here? Well, thank you for asking. It's, it's been wonderful. Um, I've, I've very much enjoyed um, building relationships and continuing that process. Um, I feel like I have a long way to go. I'm meeting people all the time and um, I feel like I've settled in well and um, you know, I'm very much enjoying the community, the commitment to mental health that's here um, has been very special and um, meeting a lot of folks that have that commitment that want to volunteer and lend a hand um, through the coalition that we run. Great. And your position reports into the town manager's office or that's to Elaine's office? Or? To the town manager's office, that's correct. Yeah, Actually and, and the same office, but. I had an interesting <laughs> question from a member of the public at Family Day like, well, what do we need you for if we have the interface service, right? Or what, does it supplant your service? And I would say no, it's a nice tool for us. It's a very nice tool for us to use, but um, what, we, what still happens is we get the referrals from the schools very often because if you have a tricky situation you're working through with a child or we're then freed up instead of racing around trying to find a provider that services a specific need for a kid there's somebody doing that where we can then sit with the parents who are distressed who are tired who have been in this process for a long time feeling very alone and we're able to sit with them and say what have you tried what's worked for you, what hasn't worked, and then come up with creative approaches to support the family. And then sometimes we, we carve out a piece. We might be the primary therapist, but the child needs a different type of evaluation, and Interface is working on that kind of service. And then Interface will refer back for all the kids that don't have insurance that's easily accessed in this area. Um, they're referred back to our department. So we're excited about this, because it streamlines things for everyone. And, um, yeah, so it's on our website, so if folks want to find the Interface Hotline, they can go on to, um, you know, the town's website and find our page, and it's right on there. Um, these cards are, you know, I hope folks look, find them all about town, because they'll be going into businesses, and they'll be going about town as well, or they could just call our office, and we'll get them the information that they need. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Next up, Hopkins and Garden Club presentation. Presentation here with some pictures, so get this started. Uh -huh. so, does this show up here? Yes, it does. Wow. Yes, it will show up. It does. Okay, we can only get the little tiki in here. Thanks for coming. My, the Garden Club was one of my mother's favorite things when she first moved to Hopkinton. Great. She just loved it. Yeah, this is looking for a password. Right. Is that your new house? It's printed right on the front. Oh, that's a very old house, isn't it? That's a shed. <laughs> Thank you. I'm trying to build a shed. What, because you have a truck now? Okay. I think I work next. There we go. There we go. Okay, I'm um, Ann Hogaboom. I'm 16 Alprilla Farm Road, um, and I'm currently the president of the Garden Club. Um, Diane McCauley is with me, who's a prior president, and also uh, Rhonda Levy, who's also a past president. Um, we um, really want to thank the board for giving us a few minutes tonight to speak about, um, about our club. We really want to thank Norman for suggesting that we do this um, because he really felt it would be good to update you on exactly what we're doing in the town. Um, 
the first thing is who we are. We're obviously the Hockington Garden Club. We've been in the town for 95 years. Um, we are part of the Garden Club Federation of Massachusetts. We have 46 members, um, and we have both a, a variety of very experienced gardeners, and we have a lot of new gardeners that are just interested in learning. We're obviously all volunteers, and um, all of our projects are funded through our two fundraisers, which is our May plant sale, and then also our holiday green sale, which we'll have this year for the second year, and uh, that will be part of the holiday stroll, so there'll be a tie-in. And we also have a very successful uh, business sponsorship program, which helps us uh, fund all of the plantings that we do. Um, our primary focus function is really our town beautification. And I know everybody goes through town, they see a lot of these sites, but I'm not sure if everybody realizes how many we really take care of. We have 14 planters up and down Main Street. Um, those actually, we purchased um, these 14 new planters a couple years ago. They're self-watering, which was a big boost for us. We also do another nine sites within the town that took the door boy, the uh, welcome sign, uh, the corner at 85 and 135. We just feel that this beautification that we do really makes our town more welcoming, uh, both for our, um, our residents and also visitors coming into our town. Um, we also are involved in many other town activities. Um, we do arrangements every month for the veterans breakfast at the senior center. Uh, we take part in the Hopkinton uh, Center for the Arts, Arts in Bloom, which is in the summertime uh, where works of art are paired with uh, an arrangement done by one of our members. We also take part in the Books for Bloom, Books in Bloom, which it will actually take place in October this year at the library. And there the library has picked out selected books and some of our members do designs to coordinate with those. We were also part of Family Day, um, even with the bad rain that we had at the beginning. Uh, we gave out almost 200 pumpkins to kids, and plus we gave them markers and glue sticks and glitter and everything to decorate them. That was very successful. We also do uh, decorate the gazebo and the library at the holiday time. So um, we obviously couldn't do everything we do without the support of the town. Norman has been great to work with. He has been, his support has been terrific, and he's really facilitated the communications within the town departments. Um, John Westerling and his DPW has been fantastic. They have been storing our uh, planters over the winter. Uh, they remove them prior to snow and when they could get damaged by, um, by snow plows. They um, also have set them in place in the spring. And then new this year, um, we had some help with our site and planter watering. And uh, Phil was the contact person for that, it was great communication. So the town was helping us out by watering once a week. And then our members would supplement the additional days of the week. And obviously it varies the amount depending on whether it's new plantings, it's 99 degrees out for a week or whatever. But having that one day a week that the town did it was just, was giant for us. Um, the other thing that we do is uh, we do education for the town. We have at our meetings, uh, we have five to six speakers per year um, on various topics. We've had one already on bad bugs and good bugs, and also we've got one coming up in pruning um, and some container gardening. All of our presentations are free and open to the public, so all that information is on, online so that the public can know that. We also do have member workshops that we do uh, where, again, we have some of our newer members and long-term members work together on various projects. It's a great learning experience for everybody. We do have a scholarship that we give to um, Hopkinton residents uh, for higher education if they're going into the field of, um, of horticulture or environmental. And then we also do maintain a social media site uh, which gives some tips on gardening, information, that type of thing. So going forward, um, we really look forward to continuing the close relationship and great communication we have had with the town departments. 
um, especially the DPW. Um, but I guess at this point, what we really are asking of the select board is to inform us of any town projects that could really impact what we do in the town. And obviously, the first thing that comes to mind is the downtown initiative. Um, we are interested in being involved in some of the um, streetscaping design when that happens, but also just really getting some advance notification if anything is going to impact where we put our planters down the main street, if anything's going to impact the commons uh, where we hold our plant sale or where we have gardens like Mr. Brown or uh, the Doughboy and also the corner at, at um, 85 and 135. Obviously, we do plantings there. Um, another thing that we have actually requested as some of these plans are being done for the downtown Water is obviously essential to having healthy plants. So um, if there's ways to get additional either spigots or uh, sprinklers into some of the uh, sites would obviously be a big help to us. Um, again, we are very proud of what we do in the town. We appreciate, but we also, again, we know it's only with the joint efforts and um, good communication with the town that we've been getting. So thank you for your time and uh, we appreciate your support. Thank you for everything that you do. It's nice to. Uh, you. that you guys are uh, keeping Hopkin and great. Well, thank you. Um, I did also bring some brochures that we usually have at any of our events that talks about our town, but I think it looks very professional, and we've handed out a lot of these at different town events that we do. So. Quick question to the chair, if I may. Yeah, thank you very much for coming. I, get, I have a quick question. When is the, the pruning person coming? Because I really know, I need to know when to prune hydrangeas. <laughs> I you know, I, I have a fight with my wife, and I know Todd and his wife fight about this one all every single spring. season. This isn't about you. You're not recognized. January, February. <laughs> yeah, January, February. It's I on our website. It's on our website. Oh, good. It's on the, but we can find out, and we will. Thanks. Like I learned about rhododendrons you know. a few years ago, but hydrangeas, those are the tough ones. Yeah. Good. No, and again, they're always open to everybody in town. I think the planters and all the various gardens you work on are look awesome, and they make the town look so great well, from spring through fall. And Really, really a nice, nice touch. You add that to all the work that was done on the, um, the exit coming off 495 there, that strip in the middle of the road oh, yes, there. the gateway. I mean, all over town, there's so many nice projects yeah. like that. And all these things the scouts do for the Eagle projects and everything, it just looks great. So I just thank It makes you a big much. difference. And I mean, we also, when we're out working on our planters or anything, it's amazing how many people will stop and say thank you or they look great or whatever. So people yeah. are aware and they notice themselves. So. awesome. I, I don't know, this is a nice summer that we had, or the wet spring, but the planters this year I thought were exceptional. They oh, really you. were beautiful. Well, thank you. I mean, it does take a lot of work because we have to make sure they're watered, but um, we also, our members are out there deadheading, replacing something if it isn't going to make it. So, um, but again, we've, um, we've been putting a lot of extra attention into it, and we are very proud, too, of what they look like. Mm -hmm. Thank well, you. Really shows. I mean, it, it really does make the town pop. Mm -hmm. Everything looks so pretty. And uh, when I have friends visiting, I say, wow, who, who yep. takes care of all this? And uh, now I know. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Thank so, you. Awesome. Community effort. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Upper Charles Trail Committee. Guy's getting serious, taking his coat off. <laughs> He's a fighter. You give us a minute. We, we have Dropped a PowerPoint well. presentation. It's sufficiently warm in here. He's a big Michigan fan, not Michigan State. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Blue. Michigan State. <clears throat> so while we pull this PowerPoint up, we might need your help. I think it would save to the desktop. It is. All right, save to the desktop. Okay. You have anything on that Michael's room? Why don't I approve that while we're this while we're Jane, while we're waiting for you guys to get going, we're just gonna bang through the select the um, consent agenda. Sure. Okay. Uh, select board will consider approving the 9, 10, 19 minutes uh, and a parade permit for the Michael Liznow Respite Center. Uh, does anyone have anything they want to break out? Okay, so. Hearing none. 
Any? Uh, Mr. Chair, I move to approve the consent agenda as written. Second. <laughs> Any further discussion? No. Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Carries. I need a mouse. <laughs> number six. Let's bang operation. up number six. Number six, section 12, restaurant al alcohol, change of hours on Thanksgiving Day, Scanlon LLC, DBA, Cornell's Irish Pub, 229 Hayden Row. Ellen is here. Uh, Ellen is here. Uh, we may not need her to come up. Uh, Ellen, is there anything different on this than we've done uh, over the last few years? Is she here? Yeah, Okay. Same, same thing. Uh, we've had no problems. Uh, with them doing this, uh, does anyone have any anything to? Um, this is this is the select board will continue approving change of hours opening at 8 a.m. instead of 10 a.m. on Thanksgiving Day for Cornell's. Uh, yeah, so uh, so uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve the change of hours for Cornell's Irish Pub for Thursday, November 28, 2019, allowing it to open at 8 a.m. Second. Okay, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Abstentions, it carries. All right, Jane, you are up. Okay, thank you for having us tonight. Let's see if we can pull this puppy up. But um, I'm Jane Moran, the chair of the Upper Charles Trail Committee. This is Barry Rosenberg. He, he is our treasurer. Thanks. And Bob Snyder, he is our secretary. I'm sure you know all of these folks. So we, here we go. So um, thank you for having us tonight. And we're here to update the select board on the progress of the Upper Charles Trail Committee progress and future plans. Just as a quick reminder, the vision of the project comes from five Mass Massachusetts towns who have elected to repurpose abandoned rail beds and um, make them into a multi-use tra multi trail, linking the five times together. And you can switch the slide. Here we go. So this slide shows the conceptual vision of where the trail in Hopkinton could go. This will con provide connectivity between Ashland and Milford. But for the purpose of tonight's meeting, we will only be talking about the section highlighted in red, the section around the school complex. There we go. So this is a photo of the campus trail connector that was built last year. As a reminder, the campus trail connector is a conceptual plan to create a multi-use trail 12 feet wide from the Marathon School through EMC Park, crossing Hayden Row, and entering the school complex on this path. This is the entrance to the rear of the school campus as it enters the wooded property. It is located exactly opposite the EMC2 Park entrance. You may have seen it. We recently became aware of a series of state grants that may provide funding for engineering and construction costs to complete the campus trail connector. So this will be, this will tie in all of the Hopkinton schools except for the Elmwood School. It will be a multi-use path that will be 12 foot wide and a hard surface uh, pavement that will ex be accessible for all persons, especially people with disabilities of all ages. The Upper Charles Trail went to, before the school committee over the summer and they voted unanimously to allow the Upper Charles Trail to pass through their school campus. Mm -hmm. The campus trail connector will follow the path of the abandoned rail bed on the campus, crossing the loop road twice and connecting to the center trail. This provides a great opportunity to provide another option to get our students off the roads into the woods to the downtown area on a safer passage. I have to mention also there is a matching grant requirement to apply for this grant. The town can meet this with the monies that the town has already spent on previous work. For instance, engineering studies and actually building this entrance trail that you saw. We also anticipate CPC funding.
So, why are we here tonight? So the Hopkinton Upper Charles Trail is charged with this undertaking. While this is a standalone project, the committee expects it will eventually become part of an eight mile Upper Charles Trail through Hopkinton. I would like to extend the invitation to the select board tonight to attend our public meeting on October 2nd from 6 o'clock to 7.45 at the Hopkinton Public Library. We will have several specialists in attendance to help address questions and hear feedback from our citizens and town officials. We expect the police chief, deputy fire chief, uh, Dr. Kavanaugh from the school superintendent, a member of the school committee, our VHB project engineer, our VHB wetland specialists, and just, just mention a few. So in closing, I would like to ask if you have any questions. The only question I have, Jane, is um, last year when that construction of that trail going from Hayden Road down, you were met with quite a bit of apprehension from that neighborhood group. Have you smoothed the waters out with those people? Yes, we've met for over probably two years with those folks. First before we started the project and then during the project and after the project. And we, draw, we drew them into the conversation at every step of the way. Um, the last time we met, I actually brought them up to speed and let them know that we probably wouldn't be going forward until we find out about the various funding projects. Uh, we did promise them some sort of mitigation in the area of either fencing or uh, some sort of natural screening, and we were leaving that up to them to choose what they would like, and they're comfortable with that, to the best of my knowledge. They are agreeable to wait until we get whether we know we have the state funding or not. So because there's an opportunity within the state funding for the town to apply for the costs for either fencing or shrubs. So we would like to play this out and see how it feels. But they seem to be comfortable to go along with us at this point. And we've met with Norman and Elaine and many times with them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? So what do, you, what do you need from us as a board? Okay, so tonight I think we're just asking you to listen to our update. At a future date and time, when we have all of the puzzles of the pieces together for the entire project, it will be up to the select board to make a final decision on whether you, know, you want this path or that path or whether this is a viable project going forth. This is a standalone project that we are allowed within our um, committee to do. And where we had this opportunity come up for the state, various state funds, that, and so we thought that this was going to be a really viable option, an opportunity for the town to tie in all of the schools together with the EMC project and connect it to the center trail and to the downtown project. So, if I may, um, I thought that when we created that trails management committee, that everything was going to kind of funnel through them. So, I don't understand why you guys this are is here. A, uh, Norman can answer that better than I could, but m our, my understanding is that this is a separate trails committee according to our charge. So that, that everything else. We have a specific, we have a very specific charge to create this um, Upper Charles Trail from Milford to Ashland. Uh, the, the Trails Coordination and Management Committee is, is somewhat different in that they are managing different aspects. In fact, we really requested that the select board take this project on because we, as the only Trails Committee in town, were getting tons of requests. Well, can you do a trail in Woodville? Can you do a trail on the other side of 495? And um, we found that we only have jurisdiction for this seven or eight mile path, and that's it. We don't have jurisdiction over spur trails or connecting trails to different neighborhoods to our main path. So our vision is to have this main path from Milford to Ashland and then work with the Trails Management Committee for input and um, have them go out and do spur trails to different neighborhoods that are interested in having their neighborhood be able to access this major trail. 
I hope that clarifies, but Norman may so, be able to. Mr. Kamalo, that is not my understanding of the situation. What is your understanding of the situation in general? I mean, you guys are doing a great job. <laughs> Thank the trails, you. And, and the new committee is going to do a great job. Yeah, too, they are. The trails are they really are. They're really taking off, and it's going to be just a, a great asset for everybody. Uh, I was running the other day, and two students with backpacks were walking to school through the center trail. So to someone's point, it's working in that regard, too. But this trails thing is still seems a little muddy to me that I thought we cleared this up. Yes, through the chair. Very simple concept. The formation of the Trail Coordination and Management Committee was premised on the recognition that there are different entities in town working on different trail issues. There was also a recognition that there is some sense of agency in completing the Upper Charles Trails Committee. Right. So their work remains as was before the coordinating committee was formed. And then number two, uh, remember there were benchmarks that were set for the Upper Charles Trails Committee. Annually they will meet to review X. The different entities in town, including the Upper Charles Trails Committee, feed into that process. Okay, so fair enough, I'm, I understand what you're saying there. And maybe this is just a little bit of the growing pains as we get the trails management process that are organized. So forgive us guys while we go through this a little bit. But it was my understanding that when we put the Trails Management Committee in place, that the Upper Charles Trails Committee would go through that organization and then they would come to us to make these final determinations. I never was under the impression, and I'd like to check the notes on this and perhaps the tape, that we were gonna keep the Upper Charles separate and have, because Business 101, there's no point in having the other committee then. Because, oh, no. because we wanted to get one body to oversee all the trails coordination in town. And what, what I'm hearing tonight is that we have one trails committee still over here and then this other body's over there. That's not what I voted for. And if that's what happened, then I'm gonna put a motion on the table someday soon to change that. So we have to figure that out. If I could, through the chair. Jane, let me just finish this with Mr. Kamal first though. Do you understand where I'm coming from? Yes, I do. There may be a perception that one committee is out there and the other committee is down here. Practically speaking, there's coordination. Mm. And also, again, we go back to the agency behind completing the Upper Charles Trails Committee. If there is true coordination in place, Mr. Kamalo, yeah. the Upper Charles Trails Committee would make their presentation to the Trails Management and Oversight Committee, whatever, I can't remember what we called it, and then they would come to the Board of Selectmen and maybe with these folks with them and sit down, because that's why we wanted one of them on that committee, mm -hmm. and they would come to this board and make their recommendations. So we don't have six different people or six different organizations like we had the last 30 years to working on trails. Yeah, I, I think that point is well taken. I think that point is well taken. In the future, we will invite the... Um, I, if I could, through the chair. Sure. Um, we actually met with the Trails Coordination Committee um, a week ago and shared our vision of this. Uh, there was some minor discussion about some of the finite points of the particulars. But if you look at our charge and read our charge for the Upper Charles Trail Committee, it is exclusively independent of the Trails Management Coordination Committee. Yeah, I think see, you have to look at your I think you have to look at your wording. Yeah, that's and I apologize. I don't mean to debate with you personally because I think this is more a board issue than anything else. That the Upper Charles Trails Committee predated this new committee by several years. And one of the reasons we I personally was behind this new committee because I'm not a big fan of always adding more sort of layers to everything was to get it all under one umbrella. And if that's still not clearly understood by everybody, then there's something, there's something amiss here. Well, maybe, through the chair, maybe I can help clarify this. When the Upper Charles Trail finishes its mission, as stated in our charge, this seven or eight mile trail, we're done. Yeah. The Trails Management and Coordination Committee will continue forever. They're two very distinct responsibilities and um, charges, if, so, if I could understand. I'm just going to stop this. This isn't anything to do with what's on the agenda right now, from what I see. We can table this and put this on another word and running behind, but um, we need to uh, kind of move on. Okay. We got your, we got your update on the, on the trail, and 
Uh, we're appreciative and thank you. And the trails are doing great. Yeah, absolutely. No question there. They it's are. how we're going to manage so, the trail things. So, to, to answer <laughs> Selectman Catano's question, um, we just needed you to listen tonight. And when we have this whole total package brought together, we will be seeking your final approval for which trail you want to administer, which is very different from trails management. Right. So and that's what we will be looking for. Totally get that. Totally get that. I know. Different. Totally get that. But my <laughs> view is, before you come to us for that, you have to go to this broad committee for their input as well. We did. We did. We did. But then they should be here tonight endorsing or not endorsing what we're talking about. Mr. Kamal, we cannot have multiple lines of communication on trails. That's what we wanted to get away from for the last 20 years. Your point is well taken. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys. You're welcome. Sorry about all that. It's not really you. It's us. I believe it's, it's him. Kamal and I. Exactly. <laughs> I think this trail is a great idea. It keeps the kids off the roads sure. and around the it is a great idea. All right, so next is the FY21 budget calendar and message joint meeting of the Select Board, School Committee, and Appropriation Committee. Second bell's gonna ring, you're gonna get a detention. <laughs> yes, please. I agree with you. I know it wasn't the next debate. No. We'll look at, we'll look at the tape. Mm -hmm. Good evening. How's everyone tonight? Sorry for running a little bit late. It's not my style generally, but much we can do. So, uh, the consent agenda, no, nope, I'm sorry, wrong one. Uh, Mr. Kamala, why don't you walk us through this? Yes, um, through the chair. Uh, first off, let me recognize um, CFO Tim O'Leary, uh, Ben Sweeney, the uh, Procurement and Grants Manager, uh, Elaine Lazarus, uh, Dave Naltajian, the Town Accountant, uh, uh, as well as uh, the School Superintendent, uh, Dr. Kavanaugh, uh, as well as uh, the Business Manager, uh, Susan Rothamick. Um, we have spent some time uh, over the last, I believe, uh, eight weeks going over what possibly could be the opportunities and challenges uh, in the FY21 budget process. Uh, tonight's discussion begins our formal public process for considering the fiscal year 2021 budget for the town. Uh, this important annual process gives us a chance to consider the needs of the community, the value that the town government provides to its citizens, and the cost burden that we will ask our neighbors to bear so that we can continue to deliver the vital public services. In the coming days, uh, with guidance provided by the Select Board, I will be providing direction <coughs> to town departments on development of the FY 2021 budget, uh, as Section 3.2 of the Town Charter requires the town manager to do so. Uh, tonight's discussion is intended to help me refine that budget formulation direction. Uh, as we have said many times over, we try to improve our budget process each year. 
as experience shows us how we can do a better job of framing the trade-offs between mission accomplishment and cost to help the town's elected leadership and eventually town meeting make an informed decision about spending. Uh, to start this year's discussion, we are recommending a top-line budget level that will result in a tax impact on existing property owners of 2.5%, not including debt that has been approved as excluded by town meeting and the voters. Uh, to that end, I ask that the board endorse this 2.5% tax impact as a starting point tonight. Uh, as, as I speak, I also want to refer you to the chart that is up on the screen. Um, later on, the CFO, Tim O'Leary, would provide more detailed comment on uh, some of the issues that I will point out. Again, first and foremost, I am asking that the board endorse the 2.5% tax impact as a starting point for the budget development process. The principal sources of new funding are this 2.5% tax increase, tax revenue from new growth tied to residential construction and improvement, and smaller expected changes in excise tax and the current debt load. Using the financial forecasting information that was included in the Appropriations Committee report developed for our last town meeting dated May 6, 2019, our current estimate is that we would generate approximately 4.1 million from a 2.5 tax increase, new growth, and other smaller revenue stream changes. This 4.1 million revenue increase still looks reasonable at this time. We will have a better understanding of growth in revenue after the assessors complete the annual property tax evaluation cycle by the beginning of November. And as the budget process unfolds, we will develop a better picture of what we can expect from other revenue streams, including excise tax, state aid, and the free cash expected to remain from the FY 2020 operations. It's not worthy that an overwhelming majority of these new dollars, I'm referring to the 4.1 million, uh, will be needed simply to pay salary increases of existing employees which have already been negotiated and employee health care costs that we work to negotiate but that are not substantially within our control. Residential growth within the community is a major focus for us in the budget process. And while growth provides us with new revenue, it also results in new demands for service and associated costs. An important part of the budget process will be trying to understand how the limited amount of new resources available above what is needed to fund existing pay raises should be allocated to meet new service needs. Uh, in your packet, I included, and we also have this uh, um, um, beamed on the screen, a spreadsheet that presents a framework for discussing how budget targets might be allocated among the different functional areas of the town operating enterprise for budget submission purposes only. This approach recognizes that growth may not impact all departments to an identical degree. The spreadsheet does not represent any kind of budget decision, but simply offers a starting point for a long and deep discussion about how the community will balance available resources and community needs. My intention is coming into this meeting tonight to solicit your input on the top level budget formulation guidance that will be communicated to the departments. I simply plan to use the spreadsheet tool to give departments within each functional area a budget formulation target. To that end, I am asking for your feedback on the targets that are shown on this sheet. And I refer you to the targets that are shown under the 
call them um, in the blue. The cube. Yes, in the blue or, or purple. Am I color blind now? <laughs> yeah, it's the last column effective FY21 increases. I also ask you to endorse, yeah, I also ask you to endorse the proposed plan to request that each, each department submit a prioritized list of critical needs or needs related to community growth that cannot be accommodated within the budget target with the value of each list not to exceed 1 to 1.25 percent of the budget request submitted. We do not expect to have the resources to provide additional across-the-board funding increases at that level. But gathering this information will inform the allocation of any limited additional resources that might become available. These budget submissions will give us two things. A base budget that keeps tax impact within 2.5% and an additional list of department prioritized items for review if, and I underline that, new growth or other revenue allows for the consideration of additional services. In the course of the budget process, I believe we will hear from departments about needs for new services related to new growth and about needs in our existing service program. I hope the approach I've identified will help the boards here tonight and eventually town meeting to develop a well-prioritized, risk-informed funding plan for FY 2021. I'm here to listen to your feedback and to your responses to my three questions. First, about the 2.5% tax impact. Second, about the top-line targets for departments. And third, about the ideas of prioritized supplemental request lists. And at this point, with the Chair's permission, I'll ask the CFO to share his comments with the meeting. You have my permission. Thank you, sir. Uh, just a few quick comments to follow up on the town manager's introduction. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to several things about the upcoming budget process. First, we have an important opportunity to revisit the efficiency of existing operations. And all of our departments should be taking advantage of this annual chance to look for savings in how we do business. We also need a process that helps the town think carefully about critical needs related to community growth and to weigh those needs against other strategic opportunities. I expect a lot of discussion about balancing what we can afford, the risks we face, and the opportunities that we have before us. The town manager outlined a very valuable approach in his comments with a base budget request tied to our expected funding level and a data call for a prioritized list of additional needs linked to strategic goals and community growth. Getting that information in that framework will support the difficult discussions we'll need to have in the coming months. Our long-term budget situation is challenging. The significant majority of our spending goes to employee salaries and benefits and to debt service for our strong building and recapitalization program. Debt service is well defined and predictable, but the growth in salary and benefit costs is consistently well above 2.5%, and that creates a long-term structural challenge for us. As an additional factor, our budget process doesn't really include a strong, consistent, multi-year approach to carving out funding for the replenishment of capital equipment. The town manager's target has a tentative placeholder of $1.5 million for pay-as-you-go capital costs, but we need to move toward a structured, ongoing process to identify and prioritize equipment replacement needs. Looking at the numbers for FY21, the big takeaway is the same as it was for FY20. New revenue from residential construction and renovations will contribute more to our treasury then we'll gain from a 2.5% property tax increase on our existing tax base. In looking at this issue, I keep coming back to a single data point. The 1.7 million shown on the sheet there in purple at the top of the screen on your left uh, that we would raise from a 2.5% tax impact is well below what would be needed just to fund 
the pay raises in current employee contracts. We're continuing to rely on new growth to cover the rest of those raises and to cover health care cost increases for both school and other town employees and to try to fund any new positions or expanded services. That is a very strong reliance on growth to cover needs, including the sustainment of current operations, and we will be facing a significant adjustment when growth eventually tapers off. As we work through the budget process, making progress on a long-term vision about how to sustain operations in a post-growth or stalled growth period will be an important priority. I look forward to working with you, our excellent town team, and our very engaged community uh, in the coming months on this challenge. Thanks. So does anyone on the board have anything to add to this or jump in on? Um, all set? All set. Yeah. So um, great job putting this together. It really helps kind of start to frame the conversation. And uh, if you were here a few minutes ago, like, like with the trails, uh, Upper Charles Trails Committee, they're doing great job, excellent work. I don't always agree with some of the things that go on, obviously, but that's okay. Uh, I think you guys are doing excellent work in the office in general. And I think the organization of our finances is really, really strong now. And I'm really confident in having debates with you that you know what you're talking about. So that's a really good thing. Because <laughs> uh, in the past, that wasn't always the case. Either I didn't know what I was talking about or somebody else. Um, my concern is, my concern is um, we're, setting the bar, we're setting the bar right away at the department level higher than we've ever set it before. So this will be a little bit of Mr. Kamal and I right now. So we're looking at basically 4.25, whatever take the average is, of those purple column there to your, to your, to your colors line is issued. That's much higher than we've ever done before. Yeah, um, you're absolutely correct, and that's a good comment. The, the reason is twofold. Um, clearly, from our preliminary, preliminary discussions uh, with the departments, uh, everyone is feeling the effects of growth. Mm -hmm. And we're tying that to past practice, where uh, we have seen budgets um, are, are trending upwards uh, because of that growth we're not seeing that slowing down in the coming two years. So that's, that's one of the reasons. Uh, the second reason we did that uh, is simply because of uh, the review and analysis that we did of the revenues. Uh, we felt comfortable moving in this direction because in this case, our starting point was basically looking at uh, uh, the town's ability to, to pay. So would, would this approach, which is a little bit different than in the past, but based on the work that's gone into this, I can see why we're looking at it this way. With this approach, would this change the discipline of the zero-based budget policy that we've had in the past, where everyone starts with a clean slate, and they walk in and they put their salaries on the table, and they put the merit on the table, and they put the steps on the table, and they build the budget from the bottom up so that we can then have that analysis and debate per department? Another good question. The intention is not to change or move away from that approach. That will fall largely on your shoulders, right? Because you're the day-to-day -day oversight to this process of that discipline. Correct. Right? Fair? Fair. Okay. I'm good. I just have a question. Have you spoken to John Neese about this particular new growth figure? Uh, this is the new growth figure that was in the appropriations report in May. And uh, I talked to John about what the prospects were for getting an update for, you know, we do the five-year forecast in the, in the appropriations report. And I talked to John about the prospect of getting an update, and he said it would really be premature to give an estimate even of what we're getting this year and what we would get next year before they complete their work in November. Right. Fortunately, that, I, I believe these were conservative numbers to start with. We haven't seen any indication that would make us doubt that these numbers are, uh, that their numbers are at risk yet. Uh, but we really wanted to go with the numbers that we've gone public with in May. In fact, through the chair, um, 
that conversation is actually broader than uh, simply um, the conversation between the CFO and John. We also include the land use departments in the conversation because the, the developments are generated through that department. Well, what concerns me in the budget, and thank you again to, to, to um, uh, go on what uh, Mr. Hur was saying. You know, this is a, it's a great scene, it's so succinct. It's, it's tight, easy, you know, and the, and, the, and the two big red numbers there. Um, what worries me is, is our dependency on the new growth. Yeah. Uh, is that, members. you know, well, we had that, that growth committee that came up uh, last uh, that, that we just started and the, and the you know, goods cut it down to 12 building permits and all of that stuff. Uh, you know, 12 building permits would have given us uh, a couple hundred dollars as opposed to 2.4 million. Um, you know, and, 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 and seeing the growth everywhere, but we, you know, we have to be careful and go back to what Mr. Hur was saying is, is to grow it from the bottom up just to make sure that we're not too dependent, that we might be able to bank some of this so we can look into banking it for, to, to replace the uh, Elmwood School and, and some of the other things that we might have to do in the near future. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's good to see that we're able to um, be a growing community that pe people want to come to and want to be at as opposed to some of those, uh, some of the poor communities in Western Mass that are, that are losing population and, and fighting bu budget shortfalls. So thanks for uh, keeping it nice and tight. Thank you. Yeah, I, I echo what, uh, you know, what everyone's saying. This is, this is wonderful. It's easy to see. Um, it really puts it, puts it all into perspective when you see how the new growth numbers really dwarf the tax increase. And, and while there's this strong push to slow down the growth, um, it certainly concerns me that you know, the, this reliance on it is, is going to either result in fewer services in the future or higher tax increases in the future. So it almost seems like a, uh, an addictive uh, <laughs> source of funding that we keep on, keep on taking. Um, but I, I, it's nice to see it laid out like this, and, um, and it gives us food for thought as to how we can start uh, looking at the budgets as we move forward. So thank you. Carol or Susan or Mina, you guys want to comment? Um, I think they have a presentation that Dr. Kavanaugh has. So in terms of the needs and where we are, how we started off. So I think it'd be great if Dr. Kavanaugh could speak to that first. some slides that I had put together for the last school committee meeting, but I think that they are a very good illustration of where the school department is starting in this budget season. I think that it's very important for us to articulate uh, from the get-go just the enormity, I think, of this year's need. And so people could have seen this on Thursday night at the school committee, but this um, a very similar presentation is actually available through HCAM and other places. Uh, but as we go into the FY21 budget, the schools this year, it's probably no surprise, are going to have a whole lot of asks, um, if we can use the term. And I think that those will be both capital and operational. And you know, every time I'm here before the Board of Selectmen or I'm with the school committee, we are constantly watching the enrollment data. And as you've been able to see all summer long, you know, th things seem to be going along on target. NESDAQ had given us a number of 113. And then in the last 10 days before school started, we had 100 plus students enrolled. So there's another one of those surprises. And, and here we are in this situation. 
Uh, the other thing that's been happening is that we have a capacity study underway, and DRA, an architectural firm that also does capacity studies, came in to meet with all of the different school administrations. And I'm only highlighting the high school here. They were the first ones to go. Um, but what we've seen is sort of this pattern all over the district. So what I've done is broken this into three categories. What does it look like in terms of capacity? And please know this is very preliminary. This is only based on dialogue in a room with high school administration and DRA. Um, the impact that that capacity has on people and the impact that the capacity has on learning. So I'll just highlight a couple of those at the high school on a daily basis. Our classrooms are about 98 filled to capacity. So there are very few empty rooms. And when there is an empty room, it might be you know, during a B block on day three that that would happen. But on day four and day five, that room is filled. And that comes about because sometimes wellness classes would meet, but sometimes not, for example. So it's not as if we could give that room away to another course. Uh, the freshmen and the junior classes no longer fit in the auditorium. Those classes are now so large that we <coughs> cannot seat either one of those two classes to have a class meeting in that space. Our computer labs have been dismantled. We're totally fine with that now that we've gone to a one-to-one. -one. Uh, but our teacher workrooms have also been reduced to three. When that building was originally built, every department had a workroom. So today, we have teachers who don't have their own classrooms and don't have their own workrooms. So they are really just wandering around the high school finding a place to plan lessons, assess uh, student work, and, and do those kinds of tasks that teachers do every single day. We are currently down to two meeting rooms at the high school. One of them is a fairly good sized uh, conference room and the other one is a very small conference room that is off the main office. So even to find a place for our administrators, our teachers, our guidance department, special education to hold meetings, the space is really compromised. In terms of our people, every single teacher in the high school teaches in more than one classroom. Or at least that's what we heard from our administration. And what that's starting to do is sort of strain some of the relationships between faculty because I may want to sit in a room where I've just taught and grade papers while you come in to teach and there's that sort of, I'm not sure how about the level of comfortability. Uh, lesson planning and assessing has become challenging and now what was happening with our kids is we send them out on privilege and we like to do that because there really isn't space for them to have a study hall. Um, if you go to the next box over there uh, under learning you can see that we have 100 plus kids who are gathering in that cafeteria every day for study hall because there are no classrooms to have study halls. Uh, kids are now getting closed out of classes, so if you wanted a particular AP course, once we get to a level where we say that teacher couldn't possibly teach that many kids in one room or those children wouldn't fit in that room, kids are not able to take all of the courses that they may have wanted to originally take. Um, our class sizes are growing. They're growing at the high school because we simply don't have places to put additional teachers in additional classes. And currently, book rooms and closet spaces have been transformed into learning spaces. And that may sound terrible as you hear it on TV, but the truth of the matter is that in those rooms, teachers have nice furniture, lamps, things on the wall, so they don't really remind you anymore of a classroom, of a closet, but let's remember no natural light gets in there and it's a small space. So that's some of the things that are happening in terms of physical plants, but I also think we need to look at the enrollment numbers. And this is where you're going to see some alarming numbers, I think, because as we just heard in the previous presentation, uh, personnel is what costs us the most money. And in the, in the schools, it's no different. 80% of our cost of our operational budget typically is uh, made up of what we pay our personnel. So I would like to just take a look at our current grade three and grade four students. Currently, in grade three, at Elmwood, we have 306 students and they are spread out across 13 regular classrooms. Right now, the average class size in third grade is 23.5 students. That's higher than we would like it to be, but it's tenable for right now. In grade four, we have 292 students. They are spread out across 12 classrooms. The average class size is 24.3. <coughs> So we're making do with that. You can do it for a year, you can do it for two years, but you can't do this long term because the quality of education starts to decline when you have bigger and bigger and bigger class sizes. 
So if we take the 1920 enrollment in grade three and grade four, and we push that forward into 2021, so the third graders become fourth graders, and the fourth graders become fifth graders, and we have conservatively added 10 students to each of those whole classes, so 306 became 316, and 292 became 302. What we're recommending, and what the principal at the Hopkins School feels she needs to do for next year, is to create 14 and 14 classrooms. That will give us an average class size in grade four of 22.5 for starters, and an average class size in grade five of 21.6. Now you may think 21.6 seems a little bit low, but if you look at the number of students that we admitted this year, we had 23 fourth graders join us. 23 fourth graders is an entire classroom, and we had eight fifth graders join us. While we would like to be able to say that we're seeing patterns in enrollment, we're not necessarily seeing the kind of patterns that lend itself to the predictability that we would like, like to have. Hopefully our capacity study will help us with some of that. But if we do go from 12 classrooms and 12 classrooms in grades four and five this year, so don't mix them up with the ones on top because at Hopkins right now we have 12 and 12. And if we bring that to 14 and 14, it means we need four additional regular classroom teachers. And if we have four additional regular classroom teachers, we also need one more additional teacher that would be made up of pieces of teachers. So we might need point two of a PE teacher, point two wellness, point two art, point two special education, you know, point one L teacher, whatever. But that would end up making up five new positions at L Hopkins alone, only based on enrollment numbers, nothing else. So if we look at the five positions and we say that those positions on average, and let's remember this is all estimation, would be about $80,000 per teacher. We're talking $400,000. So where does that leave us? As we're looking at next year, and we've talked about how a 2.5% increase to salary in education doesn't necessarily mean a 2.5% increase because uh, teachers get step raises and lane changes. So looking at the salary, if we add 2.5% to what we are currently paying our teachers, and obviously those numbers fluctuate, we may add a couple of teachers in the course of the year, we may hire somebody at 65000 who used to make 100000 so the number will, will vary a little bit. But what we're talking about is an increase of very close to a million dollars, 960000 if we think about teacher step raises and what does that mean? So for people who don't know the term step raise, it means that there are, there's a finite number of steps. Um, but if you are on step two, meaning you've taught for two years in the district, you'll move to step three. So you'll start your third year at a new step. If you start, if you're on step six this year, next year you'll move to step seven. Currently we have about 140 teachers poised to make a step raise and the average step raise is about $2,900. So we're looking at another 406,000 right there. And then we'll talk about lane changes. Lane changes means that teachers continue to educate themselves so they go from, say, bachelor's degree to master's degree, master's degree to master's plus 15. What we budgeted this year, and this is the one that is probably really difficult to pin down because you never really know how many teachers are actually going to make the lane change or not, we budgeted 200000 for that. So if we think about salary alone in the Hopkinton Public Schools next year, and that's without adding a single person to those numbers, we are at 1566000 And if we add in the previous slide, our guesstimate only for personnel at Hopkins, that's not for technology, it's not for special education, it's not for materials or supplies or textbooks, we're looking at 400,000. So we're very close to $2 million just in those two numbers right there. If 500,000 is 1% of our $50 million budget, we are at 1,966,000 for the sake of simple math, we could call it 2 million, and that's 4%. It's 4% <coughs> before we look at the needs of the high school, the middle school, the Elmwood school, the Marathon school, or any of the demands of special education, which you know are things that we are really unable to predict. It's always based on the children sitting in front of us on any given day. 
So I don't want to put a, a percentage amount on this. I don't want to put a dollar amount on it. I don't want to come before you and say, <coughs> I need 12%, 9%, 6%, 8%. But what I do want to impress upon you is that the need is going to be really great this year in terms of our operational budget. Uh, just in terms of our physical plant needs, so you know that we have the capacity study going on. Given the situation at the high school, we have an opportunity to add six new classrooms. We have very rough drawings for those. We do not have any of the you know, engineering design uh, drawings for that, and that would be an additional $350,000 before we can even put it out to bid. We are probably going to need uh, additional classrooms next year at Hopkins. When we looked at those four teachers, there are no classrooms to put those four teachers in. Uh, and when we look at the Elmwood School, the Elmwood School is also going to need additional classrooms because the enrollment has grown so markedly there. Good news, the Mass School Building Authority, the MSBA, did in fact visit Elmwood on Tuesday the 17th, and we were able to really take a look at the facility. And while we may not qualify because the facility has really been kept up quite nicely, honestly, it may not be pretty visually, but it certainly has good systems, uh, we may be able to qualify under their second criterion, which is enrollment. And this is our most recent enrollment update from the 18th of September. We were at 250 net additional students in the district this year. You can see how many have come in, how many have gone out. You can see the average class sizes. And you can see what our targets would be. While we would like our K-1 classrooms, for example, to be somewhere around 18, 19, they're currently at 21 and 23. That's an awfully big classroom for our youngest learners. Um, so I just wanted to put all of that out there so you had a sense of where we are in our beginning stages and what we're thinking about as we go into budget season. You know that we meet with each individual principal. We do a zero-based budget, so we take a look at what their real needs are. There may be places where we can take some of the things that we currently have in our budget out of the budget, but just based on, on enrollment and the kinds of numbers that we're seeing, our asks are going to be pretty big. So thank you for indulging me. Thank you. Mr. Chair, yes. if I may, um, as most of you may know, Bill's Pizza has been a very good neighbor of ours. They do allow us to use their parking lot when uh, their business needs uh, don't require the parking spaces. So I'm kindly asking, if you're parked behind pizza, Bill's Pizza, move your car. The town only has parking spaces on the westerly side of the parking lot. That is from town hall, from the building, going towards the bushes. So please, if you're parked behind Bill's Pizza, move your car. Mr. Kamala, we should probably put some signage up at some point to let everyone know, because um, you know it's easy for us to sit here and tell everybody seven or eight times in a meeting to do it, but not all uh, not all meetings have the have the uh, wherewithal to do that. So. We should probably get some signage up and, and let people know that this is not, uh, that their parking lot is not our parking lot. Yeah, in fact, we're, we're working on that. Uh, we have had meetings with Bill's Pizza, the bank, as well as the Mason's Lodge. We're simply waiting for a survey plan now. I thought you were telling us that Bill's has decided to cater the meetings moving forward. Apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, appropriations, Mike. Um, yeah, my only comments, because I'm just seeing this for the first time, I guess uh, I'm glad, you know, I like the way it's all put together. I see the numbers all right there. Um, what I don't see are, for some items, last year's numbers for comparison. Um, the new growth, is it is it uh, steady, flat from last year, or is it higher or lower? The new growth in the current, uh, through the chair, the new growth in the current year was projected to be $2 million and the new growth in 21 is projected to be 1.8. And we will be updating those estimates by November 1st. But this is based on those numbers that were in the appropriation report. I'm sorry, so you're saying the two point uh, new growth allocation, two point 
New growth with two million even in the 2020 budget that yep. we passed on May 6th. And the projection for 21 is new growth of 1.8 million. Okay. <coughs> well, I, I guess wait, I, I, I. Yeah. So, so you're asking about why the number in purple above is not 1.8 because there yes. are other factors in there. So the other factors include some expected, in, I'm sorry, I was a little slow on the uptake there. Ex, uh, some expected increase in excise tax, some expected increase in personal property tax, some expected uh, decline in debt service expense. And those factors together net to the $2.3 million number you see there in 1.8 million of that is new growth, the lion's share. Right. Okay. That was what I didn't understand. Okay, I saw the 2.3 and the numbers. We in our remarks, but we said a lot. Okay. So, All right. Thank you. Um, and uh, I guess when I was listening to the school, the school budget, you didn't give actual numbers, but that's the one I think everyone, or at least I'm kind of concerned with. Are you saying that's the target that's there? You have not have time to think about it yet, or is that substantially low, or, or you just don't know yet, or? The 5.54? Yeah. I think that's substantially low. In order for us to have the quality of education, reasonable class sizes that we have enjoyed in the past, that would be extremely low. Extremely low. I wish okay. I could tell you something else, okay. but it really is very low. Okay, I know this is a starting point, but you know, for, for what we're putting out there, but when we agree, when we kind of agree on a target, I like it to be as close as possible because when we get to January, February, when it's off and you want to keep changing it, you know, when appropriations is monitoring what's going on, we like to say, are we on the target or off the target, or you know, um, if this is the target, or I know you want to be aggressive, or you this is actually a number that you really want, but is is it realistic? And I'd like to hear a realistic number that, or is it just too early for that? I guess that's the question I have. Through or the comment chair. I have. Through the chair, if I may. Okay. Um, may I know, uh, you know, from last year, of course, first, before I even get there, I must thank the board and the community for the support, for the generous support and your service and commitment to the community and the schools, of course, which are a big part of it. Um, so not just in terms of the budget, but I know each one of you personally is so committed, whether it is supporting the 18 to 22 program, whether it is being there at the Kenya Day celebrations, the Marathon Fund Committee scholarships, um, resolving for some of getting your hands dirty and solving for the Legacy Farm North bus stop issues. So your generosity is much appreciated. Um, the question I have on my mind, I, I think we are in this together, the way I see it. We're going to look for it and go through this budget process together. And I'm just wondering um, the reason behind from last year, I recall when we had seen a similar sheet, we had started at 6.5% as the initial conversation starter. And I just want to understand why is it that we would be starting at 5.5%, uh, what is the rationale behind it, what are some of the challenges that you are seeing? I think the challenge is the, is the revenue uh, that is available uh, at this point for now, based on what we know. So, so to be more explicit in blending some of the, to the chair, some of the numbers we, we shared, the school pay raise alone is 1.6 million. The two and a half percent tax increase is 1.7 million. So that's just the school pay raises. It doesn't include the school benefits increase that are covered on the town side. It doesn't include, so you can see how consequential the pay raises are for the pool of money that is available within a 2.5% tax impact. And we are really looking for a place to start this difficult discussion. And I think in the town manager's comments, he said this is not a budget, this is a target. He talked about the possibility of an over-target list for each department that would be prioritized and would discuss needs that are not met within a target. So we're looking for a forum that both touches on the reality of our funding opportunity and that considers the opportunity for deliberation of prioritized needs later. 
and I wish I, I wish I had a uh, a better answer that we had nine percent to uh, start with, but we didn't feel it would be genuine to start with that kind of a target number because we have this unresolved question of how what will we know about the actual numbers on new growth and how will we fund that kind of a number with the kind of tax impact the community is is uh, willing to support. <coughs> so, uh, Mr. Kamala, I just want to make sure, we, I just want to stay on point here that we're working on the, the, uh, the, the budget message. And I don't want to get too deep into the weeds. We could be here till midnight getting too deep on the weeds and the speculation. Um, so, I just want to make sure that we stay on track here. Yes, it's the budget message okay. for tonight. If I may, once more, I just put some thoughts together as we are embarking on this. Um, and, you know, as Dr. Kavanaugh shared, the unprecedented growth that we are seeing in our town is a reality. And we are all in it and facing it together. We have grown from a 3,500 student body to a 4,000, near 4,000 student body within a span of a few years, right? And thanks to the foresight of our town leadership, we have a capacity study underway which will give us an insight on where we see this growth heading and when can we expect it to stabilize. Westford has 5,000 student community. Lexington has 7,000. Where will we be in the next five to 10 years? I think we need to think about that a little bit. Um, Dr. Kavanaugh also shared how the growth is being sustained. Teachers are operating out of carts and sharing rooms. Um, it reminds me of living out of suitcases, only all year round. One year, I think it's okay. Two, perhaps. But beyond that, is it sustainable? And would a child's learning experience be different when there are 15 students versus 25? How do the class sizes affect a child's learning experience? At the same time, I must say that I know the pain of tax increases on our community members, especially those with fixed incomes. They have been very generous in their support of this growth. Um, and again, I say we are in this together. And as we kick this season off, I want to explore with all of you as partners, what are the tools and solutions that we have as a collective? I will say for the school committee that we are committed to building the budget ground up as we have always done every year. Uh, we will provide transparency and welcome participation and questions. We will continue to explore more grants, generous donors, um, any possible state aid. We will share results of the school capacity study with the community. And my request as chair of the school committee would be from all the boards in the community to participate and share questions, thoughts, ideas as we embark on this budget season through an unprecedented growth spurt. So I just want to leave with that thought that we have to solve for this together. This is one community. Mm -hmm. And we will listen to what you have to say and we expect that you would do the same as well. Yep. Thank you. Mr. Sestari. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I guess it was a few days ago, uh, Mr. Kamalo was telling the Appropriations Committee his approach uh, for the budget message this year. And at first I questioned it a bit. You know, he was telling me that uh, his plan was to come in, you know, department by department, identifying how much of an increase there would be. And I'm not sure how much of a budget message that is as opposed to a budget or a budget framework. Um, you know, I understand that, you know, we're sitting here saying that, okay, this isn't the budget, uh, but I also know that three or four months from now, if this was, you know, kind of approved as the framework and any of these numbers or many of these numbers went over what they say here, then, you know, people would be asking why, you know, because they would expect us to stick to these numbers. Um, but then I also went back and, you know, I realized that if Mr. Kamal is putting these numbers down, there's a reason. Um, we need it and he feels we can achieve it. But where all of that falls apart is when we start seeing the number for the schools. And at that point, I guess, I, I think that the budget for, especially for our professionals, 
Um, it should be something that's top of mind throughout the year. And, you know, before we start throwing numbers out here in a meeting, um, you know, I really, I really wish that there was more coordination between the schools and the town. Um, I think that this is the type of thing where we see, you know, five and a half percent here, and we hear, you know, could be 12, could be 10, could be nine, could be six. You know, on the other side, I think that they get, that gets people confused. Um, and it also doesn't really show that we're trying to work together. Though, I know that you guys have good communication together, you know, when we're going through this process. But I just wish we had more communication before this initial message came out. Um, in the end, you know, as far as, you know, why this number is this and why this number is that, um, you know, I mean, we all know the answer. You know, the numbers have to work tonight. If we can't make the numbers work tonight and someone steps up and says, yeah, this is the year that we're going to have to request an override, well, that's not the way to go into the budget season if we're going to try to avoid an override. So, you know, I think that uh, it is going to be a challenging year. We have more challenging years in front of us for all the reasons uh, that we've heard um, and we've all acknowledged for the last two years. I think I've been saying for the last three years, yep, next year we're going to need an override. And I'm happy every year when I'm wrong. Um, I hope I'm wrong this year too, uh, but it's going to be a lot of work. And I think that everybody here, we need to start really working together uh, to try to knock these numbers down. It's not going to be easy. It's not that there's going to be no suffering. Even if we can't, even if we can't get it all to fit into the box, I still have a feeling that you know there's going to be some suffering that's that's being dealt with, um, and uh, but you know that's also what we pay our professionals to do. So um, I'm not sure what the board's intent is tonight for a budget message, whether it's to use something in the framework here, or whether it's to adopt a more general message. Um, but uh, I think that it. it well, I, I trust the board to come up with something. I, I'm not going to say what I think it should be. So. Good. All right, Mr. Kamalo, we're uh, we all set with this, or do we need to? What do we need to do? Um, I did. Uh, I did have uh, three questions for the board. Okay. Um, one, your approval that we uh, start. Uh, at 2.5 percent um, increases as and then um, I'm also looking for your feedback on the targets uh, and, and by the way to Mr. Sestari's question uh, if we bring up that chart we set up the chart such that we we, we provided the numbers for illustrative and discussion purposes we do understand that the, by the end of the day, the board sets the uh, spending level. So if you want to see what any change would look like, we set up the charts so that we, you can make those adjustments. Um, and, and then last but not least, uh, we did suggest that uh, we have uh, an additional prioritized list. Uh, and if the board is in support of those three items, we can then proceed to craft a budget message that we can share with departments in the next two days. I will uh, entertain a motion. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay, just, yeah. sure, so, to, so, Mr. Kamal, your, your request of the board is that we acknowledge those three criteria as part of a budget message that you're going to craft and the chair is going to approve. Is that what you're talking about here? I mean, typically that message comes out of the board after a deliberative process. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's, we've evolved over the years a little bit. But we still need to send a message out. So I guess I'm not yeah. clear as to how we're trying to do that. Yeah, we we I felt that the the three questions I posed uh, provide the building blocks for the budget message. Uh, anything else that comes around those three aspects, uh, you have the opportunity to um, propose and discuss tonight. However. From my estimation, if the three building blocks are in place, everything else around the budget message is administrative. Okay, so give me those three again, please. Okay. Um, two and a half net of new growth. 
yes, as the starting point, and then uh, feedback on the targets as depicted in the spreadsheet. Uh, again, we share those targets for discussion purposes. If you feel like you need to adjust them, you're free to do so now. And then the last piece being uh, endorsing the plan that will allow um, each department uh, to provide an additional list of needs, uh, not necessarily as a budget submission, but rather as an addendum to their submission uh, for further review if funds become available. Um, again, I, I, I do hear the, the comments regarding the, the increased needs. Uh, however, by the end of the day, it all then boils down to the revenues that are available. And as we explained tonight, we're looking at two numbers, 1.7 and 2.3 million. Mr. Chair, if I could continue a little bit here. So uh, I'm opposed personally to the targets as set in the spreadsheet being discussed in the budget message tonight. It's just way too early in the process for that in my view. Um, I'm okay with a budget message that says our, our goal is to have a 2.5% net of new growth tax increase for FY21. Uh, our goal in the budget process, in the budget process, our goal is that. Our goal, secondly, is to have a, a level services budget uh, developed from ground zero up. And then our goal would be to get a list of additional items that uh, our colleagues in the various departments would need in order to provide the level of services that residents of Hopkinton expect. Something along those lines. I just don't want this far, far right column uh, in the mix yet. I think it's too early for that. But the 2.5 covers that, and net of new growth. It does, because the 2.5 is your revenue number, your net of new growth, you can throw that in there, and then you can play around with those numbers and see how it plays out. I, I, again, if, if we're not tying what we receive in requests to the resources or revenues that are available, um, this is going to be a very long discussion then. Well, I think, it, I think that you could message to your colleagues in, in the various departments with a 2.5 net of new growth target and with level services uh, budget being requested to, to, for submission uh, and an additional list of what you need, you can, in your dialogue and meetings with folks, have those numbers in front of you and you can work that as you see fit. But I don't want to get into the detail of each budget line item with a specific target number because it's going to set the benchmark. Whether we like it or not, it sets the benchmark because somebody will write a report about it or someone will put it online or somebody will post it on a Facebook page and all hell is going to break loose. Yeah. So that's why I don't want to go there yet. We've got to manage the process and we have to manage the perception as much as anything else. I mean, it's September, I don't know what day it is, September 24th. We're light years ahead of where we would be if we start naming numbers at this part of the, in this stage of the process. Yeah. So that would be my suggestion for a yeah. budget message. Yeah, I think through the chair, based on that qualifier, i.e. Um, the targets are kept in our back pocket for reference and we can have the discussions with the department heads with the understanding that uh, we may be referencing the targets. I, I, I'm fine with that. Uh, it's just that at a time when budgets over the years, the last three years have been increasing uh, significantly, to go in without any guideline, I think, would be a recipe for a very extended discussion. The 2.5 creates, sets the bar. And then everybody knows above that there's going to be some answers that have to be given, and we'll figure that out through this process. But I think the 2.5 sets the bar, and keep in mind that uh, over the years, the 2.5 didn't even exist, it was 0.0. .0. So the, the town, I believe, is evolving as we grow, and we all recognize the growth, which is a great thing. This is a great problem to have. <laughs> kind of odd way of saying it. Because the schools have done such a kick-butt job, this is a great problem to have, but it's a problem. And so the 2.5, I think, is recognizing that growth that's taking place, and now we gotta figure it out from there. Um, so, you know, from whence we came, I think we're, we're, in, we're in good shape in that regard. Okay. If I may, to the chair. But one of the other things we have to make, we have to also recognize that 
by just saying 2.5 at the end. We're just we're actually just putting the uh, the fight within um, uh, Mr. Kamala's team and, and the rest of the board. Everybody's going to be unless we put out some kind of guidance. People are going to be fighting over to make up that 2.5. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's not just this, it, schools are great, but it's also a public safety. The reason why people are coming to our town, whether you know, one of the safest communities in the country, you know, roads and and uh, trails and everything else, which is a great place to live. And that's uh, to, to your point. People want to be here, and that's why we're growing. And uh, you know, to see this this new growth number, it's like I, you know, I keep coming back to it of 2.4 million. It's just amazing. You know, and, and it's too bad we're 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 we're, de we're depending on it so much. But we do have to put out some kind of a, a, a message, or otherwise we're going to be we're going to do that January meeting where everybody's at each other's throats. We don't want to be at that table at the at the uh, uh, at the senior center again, where people are, people are saying, "I can't. I need that one person. I need that truck. That's I need the job, that." John. That's the job. We, yeah. We're going to have to do that. That's right. No, but 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 if but you know we just have to really put it down there that in as much as it may be uncomfortable for everyone. That, was that everybody's going to have to be uncomfortable, including us, and we just can't. You know, it's it's going to be it's going to be a tough year. Right, but we can get to all that. The budget message can just be words. It doesn't have to be any numbers at all. It doesn't have to be anything other than present a budget. That's all it really has to be. By by with our bylaws, with our charter, we have to create a budget message and issue. It, it can be two words: send budget now, or three words. As simple as that. That's kind of too simplistic, I think. But we have to do something. What you're describing, I agree, we're gonna to get to that stage, but I think it's too early to do that now, and it sets the perception level in a weird place that I personally am not comfortable with. But we, if I may to the chair, we're talking to all numbers people. So we I can't think be- I any one of them are prepared to set these numbers in stone tonight. No, I, okay. I think the school committee would be, it would be unwise for anybody to set the number in place tonight, in my view. And I don't think the appropriations committee would want to do that. Mr. Chair, uh, I know I said I wasn't going to give my opinion on the message, but I'm going to give my opinion on the message. That's so unlike you, Mr. Sestari. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I agree with Mr. Hurd, which is a rarity. It's very rare. Uh, you got to mark it down, right? <laughs> um, you know, I think that setting a general message is is more appropriate uh, for a board that's supposed to be focused on the strategic rather than the tactical and rather than the operational. Um, I think that the way these numbers are right now, it really boxes everybody in. I think it's pretty clear that the number that we've got down in that spreadsheet is not something that the schools are even remotely comfortable with, even though they haven't really sharpened the pencil yet. And I know you have a general idea anyway, but um, I think that I think that our two professionals who are getting paid money to do this stuff and who are professionals in this area, um, you know, they're going to need some some wiggle room off of this if we had a chance of making anything. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I think, I think that that's the bottom line. You know, if everything, if, if all of a sudden we get a surprise and the schools, you know, come back and say, oh, yeah, you know what, we looked under this desk and we found a bunch of money and everything works out and, you know, these numbers are right, well, then Mr. Kamala is ahead of the game for his group and he can talk to his department heads and say, yeah, you know, this is what I got in mind for you. You know, now let's make it work. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that it's necessary in a budget message to be that specific. I think that he set the overall guideline and then move forward. If, if I may, through the chair, um, I, again, I think all the points are well taken. I thought that the, the third tier of our framework provides that weekly one. I think an additional 1 to 1.25% increases to the additional budgets, is we're now way past the 2.5% impact. So if, if we're talking about creating that weekly room, we have done that in the framework. It's up to, yes, it's, I think it's up to the board now to tell us whether you think the 1% to 1.25% is not sufficient. If it's not, then we, we look at a different number. Well, so, yeah. so my other, my other comment to the chair um, is if we're gonna use this framework, then I think coming from appropriations, because it was a common theme that we discussed last year, is let's take care of the OPEB number and get the OPEB number to be something realistic where we're actually catching up with the town. 
Uh, so, you know, why don't we factor that in as well? And I'm sure there are a couple others we can start discussing. But I don't think that's a discussion we want to have when we need to have it. Huh? I agree. All right, so where are we at? We need a motion? Yes, I, I, yes, I believe we have the building blocks for a motion, 2.5% net new growth um, as one goal, and the other goal being to level service, to provide a budget that uh, supports level service and building the budget from the ground up, and then providing the list of items. Uh, again, our request was that the list be prioritized and be within a certain percentage of the budget that is submitted. I don't know if that's helpful for you. So did you make well, I think that'll be, I think, I like the idea of trying to have that sort of um, benchmark for the additional list, but the additional list, I mean, uh, uh, six classrooms on the high school is not gonna be 1% uh, of that number, you know, well, that's gonna be a capital budget, but whatever. I mean, there's gonna be a lot of different ways that we can look at that. I, 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 I want to stay as verbal as we can with the budget message and then let the, let the numbers flow over the next six months to where they need to go to. Um, but setting numbers tonight I just think is extremely premature. And um, so I would like to make a motion that the Board of Selectmen issue a budget message to the community uh, that sets three goals. One, that the the board recognizes that 2.5% tax impact net of new growth uh, will be likely. Two, that the, uh, uh, our colleagues in the various departments are to develop uh, ground up budgets uh, to pro that will uh, support level services for the community. Mm -hmm. And that three, um, any additional uh, requests for budget needs um, beyond the level services be developed and benchmarked for dollar impact. I'll second it. Okay. Any further discussion? <clears throat> Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Abstentions? Carries. Thank you very much. This is the time when we would also um, get the budget advisory committee going. Um, can we? The members decided. Yeah, we'll do that administratively. I beg your pardon? We will do that. Okay. That would definitely be something we would want to see, and we've had that discussion over the years, and I think that will definitely happen, but we can do that outside of the, sort of the message itself. Okay. Sounds great. Good question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So we're 50 minutes behind already, but um, it was important. in the in the interest of time, I think our on our board committee appointments, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, I think we can probably at least bang out the first one to, to get you guys. Uh, the select board, is everyone all right with that? Yeah. yeah. Select board will consider making an appointment to the Board of Appeals. There's currently one vacancy for a full member position. The board consists of five full members and four associate members. So I'd like to make a motion to have Margaret Shaw, who's currently an associate member, be put on as a full member, and Sumitri Chowdhury be put on as an associate member. Second. Okay. No, you, no, you can make, you, he's. I made the motion. He made a motion. Oh, did you make No, I made the motion. Oh, okay. She's second. Can't make a motion. Any further discussion? Ch Chowdhury, I mean, sorry, Sumitri, how'd I do on that? Okay. Much better? That's good? Hello, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Okay. Peggy, is Peggy here? Okay. No. So, um, all right, so no further discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? It carries. Um, and then this one, the, the planning board has created three liaison p positions to the recently established growth study committee. The, <coughs> the liaison positions include a member designee of the select board, the school committee, and appropriation committee. The select board will consider designating a uh, <coughs> representative to as a non-voting member to the growth study committee 
I will entertain a motion if someone would like to volunteer or nominate somebody to be the select board non-voting member uh, to the growth study committee. That said, I would like to make a motion and um, throw John Catino to the growth study committee since he, that's what he does. He's going to throw him on. He's on everything. <laughs> so I know I have no interest or time in doing it, Mr. Herr. It's a non-voting committee to me is tough for various reasons, so I would pass myself. Okay. So there's a motion. I have not yet heard a second. Because uh, I'll second it. That's vain, but I'm, 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 that's good. I'll second it. <laughs> All right. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, any further discussion? Is there anyone else that is interested in it? Everyone took a step back. <laughs> We have a point. All right. All right. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Abstentions? It carries. Thank you. Thank you, John. <laughs> Thank you, sucker. <laughs> um, all right. So now we're ready for the Main Street Corridor project. So the Main Street Corridor project. The board has set aside time for affected property owners or businesses within the Main Street Corridor project area to express thoughts or concerns relative to the project as it affects them in particular. The board will set aside 45 minutes to an hour for the discussion. The board realizes that there may be other residents or businesses from outside the area who would like to speak generally about the project or certain el uh, design elements. But given our, given our time limitation, property owners whose properties are directly affected will have speaking priority and we will get to everybody else as time allows. At the last meeting of the, the, the board expressed interest in hearing about people's specific, quote, harm, and a list of items was provided by Jackie Pottenzoni, to which the town staff has responded. Both of these documents are in the meeting packet. To the extent that these items have already been brought to the board's attention, you may wish to address other items that weren't included. As you come forward, please identify your name and the address of your affected property. Please be mindful that others may want to speak too, so please be as brief as, as you can. Um, so that said, we will also follow the decorum that we had with Greyhound Friends and some of these other contentious things where everything will go through the chair, uh, there'll be no back and forth, um, and uh, we ask everybody who's speaking pro and, and against to be very respectful and mindful of the late hour already. So that said, uh, is there anyone that would like to come up and have something to say? Yeah, I'm Rick Kelly, 5 Ash Street. I've lived there for 47 years. Hopkinton's nightmare. What used to be a quaint country town has turned into an urban traffic nightmare. The downtown Carter project started out many years ago as a project that would ameliorate or plan and lower the traffic situation in town. Um, let me get my glasses on. I brought two pair in case, just in case. <laughs> the congestion in the town town area, we all realize is horrible. That's what the whole plan started out, to resolve. The goal is no longer realistic. There are more cars, more trucks passing through Hopkinton, straightening Grove Street and Main Street intersection to relieve traffic congestion is now only a dream. Anyone who presently thinks that you can safely bicycle through the downtown definitely has a death wish. Why should the project take away private property rights to construct bicycle lanes that will give a false sense of security to bicyclers? Do any of the project's renderings ever show a bicyclist riding side by side with a 10-ton construction truck and an 18-wheeler? or a, track haul, a trash hauler, 
the goals of the downtown corridor project are no longer valid. One of the VHB engineer, nice person, said at the September 20th meeting that the project will probably not alleviate the downtown congestion issue. So what is the point of all this expense and aggravation and as far as beautification is concerned, Hopkinton's never going to have a precious downtown. Please stop the intrusive easements on private property, pave Main Street, fix the pavements, plant some trees, and be done with it. End Hopkinton's proposed downtown nightmare. And I thank you. Thank you. Next. Norman. My name is Mary Ann Wilcher at 5 West Main Street, and I just want to ask, I, I understood that Mr. Phipps' letter was going to be read uh, before the board tonight, and I'd like to request that we start with that. Before I go, I, think, uh, I can. Right. Uh, you want me to do that? Yeah, yeah. I was going to do it after everyone else okay. had a chance to speak or speak. Yeah. Yeah. I'm happy to do it. So um, uh, she's asked that we read a letter that Mr. Phipps wrote to the board, to myself, and to the board. Um, I just have to find it now. Sorry, I was going to do this at the end of our. Uh, so this is a letter that Rob Phipps, uh, owner of 80 Main Street, I believe it is. Phipps Insurance, yeah. Uh, wrote to myself and the board. Dear Brian Hur and the select board, I am old enough to deal with inconvenience with minimal complaint and for the same reason realize that facts trump feelings in most cases. Therefore, you will understand why I find Brian's most recent comments regarding downtown property owners' concerns extremely disconcerting. Since most of us affected downtowners have been under the assumption that the select board has been driving this downtown corridor bus. Who is actually driving this project since Brian indicated he is completely unaware of the aftershocks that will be visited upon the residents and business owners should this Hopkinton version of the big dig get off the ground. The silence emanating from the rest of the board indicated a disturbing acceptance of the unknown. The Phipps Insurance Agency has owned, has conducted business from 80 Main Street since 1950. And I am but one of many who, who will be extremely inconvenienced by this grandiose disturbance of the peace for how many years? Does anyone know? Rumors abound that not only will parts of downtown be con in construction, demolition, turmoil for up to five years, but without a shovel in the ground yet, there is already over a million dollar shortfall. Check my memory, but the original big dig cost estimate tripled before completion and took three times longer than promised. Who will say Hopkinton is not looking at a similar, though smaller scaled, prospect? You forced me to repeat myself that, despite promises, no one has contacted me with the reality of what 80 Main Street is facing. Again, all the downtown property owners now seek, seeking to inform themselves have legitimate concerns. Since we are dealing with an engineering project designed for an urban setting, yet that designation is new to us, as we have little in common with the likes of Revere, Chelsea, and Somerville, right? Mm -hmm. Brian asked, rather incredulously, incredulously, can't say that word, how this project was harming anyone. Here's my story. I am looking at the probability of not being able to sell my property for an indeterminate number of years while being forced to create a permanent solution to a temporary problem by destroying several healthy pine trees, in parentheses, at $2,000 per tree, close parentheses, in order to construct a customer's employee parking lot on, the summer, on summer Street. With street parking eliminated due to unnecessary and unsafe bike lanes and our current lot in use since before 1950 blocked by construction traffic, most of our long-term clients, 30 to 60 years of loyalty, in parentheses, will be forced onto Summer Street with its inherently unsafe exit back onto Main Street. I would then suggest a no left turn sign for all. I am also looking at the damage, removal of extensive landscaping and prehistoric, uh, should, attain, should attain historic status by 2100 AD, Stonewall, 
plus the permanent presence of a bike repair <coughs> station, which is unacceptable. Due to the ever-present vehicle rodeo in front of 80 Main Street, I refused to rent the residence I grew up in for fear of the obvious. The increased difficulty to conduct normal face-to-face -face business is immeasurable, and I can't help believing that this forced alteration, as well as the increased cost and loss of liberty for all downtowners, is simply treated as collateral damage by bureaucrats, engineers, town, and state officials. Now, I know Mr. Herr means no malice towards those most affected, but his stunningly insensitive question troubles me in that we trust select board members to have their finger on the pulse of the town, and such is obviously now not now known not to be the case. When did the board abdicate their responsibility to learn more than the residents about the ramifications of this glorified beautification project? And when did they transfer communication power to so many officials who don't have a true investment in the town of Hockington? If inconvenience was the major price to pay for a supposedly town-wide worthwhile project to come to fruition, I'm sure that those of us on the giving side would acquiesce and comply. However, I remain unconvinced that the original goals of the improved traffic and pedestrian safety, which spawned the downtown corridor project, will be attained by this plan, since downtown Hopkinton will continue to have a commuter highway running through it. This last month of relatively minor Main Street road work, resulting in consistently severe traffic tie-ups, should convince anyone of the folly of expecting our tolerance and endurance for these several years. Also, the ludicrous attempt to proclaim the new cut-through Legacy Farms North Road as a downtown traffic allevi alleviator defies all logic. Well before the cost of this plan is known, Hopkinton will need yet another new school and probably an East Hopkinton satellite fire station. I suggest the select board wisely consider saving for the real near future needs of the town uh, of Hopkinton, cut their losses, and terminate further implementation of this pretty pony called the Main Street Corridor Project. Sincerely, Robert Phipps, 80 Main Street. P.S. Please explain why, please explain to all why a waiver of this game-changing bike lane granted to others, which has never been forced on a small town like Hopkinton, was not requested eons ago. That is the letter. Um, I'm addressing the plan of the corridor project to make a left turn lane in front of my house at the intersection of West Main and Wood Street near the daycare. Um, to do this, the town is essentially taking about 15 feet of my front yard. My biggest concern so far with this project has been the complete and lack of transparency. I was informed in April through a certified letter that my property would be affected by the project. It was the first time that I had been contacted or made aware of my involvement. It also included a certificate, certificate of donation in case I wanted to donate my property rights to the town. In a recent rebuttal letter stating the concerns of the people affected by the project, namely the 90 plus abutters, the board repeatedly answered their concerns or questions, the concerns or questions of the abutters with, the project was approved at town meeting and therefore represents the collective wisdom and will of the town voters. I ask you how this can be true when most of us were only informed five months ago of the impact to our property. After numerous phone calls, when I received the plot plan that was incredibly difficult to understand, I attended the informational meeting in August. The gentleman I spoke to, and I don't remember who it was, said initially, don't worry, this only requires five inches of your property. And I thought, okay, I can deal with that. That's reasonable. But then someone from the Department of Transportation came over and told me that, guess what? The road layout includes about 13 feet into your property. So it's really not five inches. It's more like 15 feet. Now, of course, they won't have to pay me for that because it's town property. So maybe I'll get something for the five inches that they're taking. My property value is going to go down tremendously. It's already difficult to sell a house on Main Street at a stop sign at a traffic light. I listen to the music of the cars. I listen to trucks stopping and starting. It is so incredibly loud. Now you're talking about bringing that 
15 feet closer to my front door. I have difficulty exiting my driveway in the morning. I have to cross parked cars to get out at 6.45 a.m. Now you're asking me to cross two additional, two lanes of traffic into a third lane. Just about impossible. Uh, my house, sorry, essentially I'll be walking out my front door and looking at traffic and looking down at the car roofs in front of me. I have a rock wall, shrubbery, trees that will be destroyed. This project will have a severe impact. My daughter's a senior at Hopkinton High School this year. This project will make it difficult for me to sell my house for years to come. I'd like to see a feasibility study and analysis of the traffic impact uh, that the additional lane will cause. I'm asking for transparency about the project so that the voters and the people affected can make informed decisions. I also want to just say that it seems like every time we have to talk about this issue, I've been at numerous meetings where it's tabled till the end of the night. And guess what? Time ran out. We're not going to talk about it tonight. And I find that affects, in my opinion, the transparency of the project. I'd like to suggest a no left turn during peak hours sign, or perhaps a sign at Lumber Street that says, left turn here for Wood Street. Please don't take my property. Please don't take my front yard. Thank you. Mr. Del Torrio, is there any truth to the statement that she's going to lose 15 feet of her yard? So I can pull there, up. There's, there's, currently there. there's stonewall and there's bushes um, that are, are within the public right way. Those are being pr proposed to be moved back to the right-of-way property line. Okay. Uh, and it, it, it looks like you know, maybe about five feet. What's the address? I, five West Main. Five West Main. I measure with a tape de uh, tape uh, measure. It, it, is, it, is several, the, uh, it is several it's feet six, of public right-of-way so behind the existing wait, back of wall. Can you I think the total impact includes the easement. It's like a 15 foot. I, I know it's the, I know so that the, the town so is the, the So the 15 feet that, that she's losing on her front yard is town property or it's her property? Well, I've been paying taxes on it and mowing the grass on it for years, but it is town property, technically. Ray, is it town property or her property? There, there's public right of way. There, so whenever you um, own property that fronts on a street, it's subject to a right of way mm -hmm. easement mm -hmm. um, for the road. Yep. And um, that easement is bigger than the width of the pavement. Um, if there's a sidewalk, it's, you, it, the easement is usually big enough to include the sidewalk area. Mm -hmm. And the little area between the sidewalk and, and the road, sometimes called the tree lawn, mm -hmm. is usually um, included within the easement. Now, I'd, you know, this, I'm speaking generally sure. as opposed to this specific yep. parcel because I haven't looked at the uh, uh, at the at the plan, but it w it is not unusual that the town's right of way extends into um, the the portion of somebody's um, front ma yard, a maintained yard that they that they are maintaining. Yep. Um, it doesn't mean that the town doesn't own it. It just means that the town has. Um, has not exercised any rights over right. it. So when the when the town decides that it wants to exercise rights over over the right of way that it owns, mm -hmm. um, it uh, normally would not um, uh, have to pay compensation for right. that. Now that said, the um, when a, uh, a a parcel of land is is affected as this one is 
then the question is what what is the impact on the actual market value mm -hmm. and uh, the fact the market value is affected by what what goes on in the in the right of way as well i assume the appraisers will take those things into consideration but um, uh, the the land that is uh, uh, part of the right of way even if it has been maintained as somebody's front yard it is not part of their actual property. Sure. So nice the taxes have not been paid against that piece of the parcel, correct? Like she's not, that square footage is not in her tax bill for the land? Yes, it is. Not if it's on the town right away. No. It, 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 I can tell you what, I have my plot plan here and I can tell you. I have it here too. Okay, so, so let's just, if we could, Mr. Chair. Yes. So our goal tonight is to have a dialogue about the things that people feel are harming them, okay? And we're not gonna solve everything here tonight, okay? What we wanna try to do is understand your concerns, and I think we have a good feel for it now. There's 15 feet, Norman, who, who am I gonna to go to here? Is this gonna to come to you? Amanda's gonna Amanda. pull up. Amanda. Okay. Amanda has the plan up. So Amanda, there. there's 15 feet at five West Main, we need to understand better, okay? And if there's some impact, and I don't need to understand it tonight, if there's some impact there, we need to make sure the appraisers understand that as we talk about the easement, the temporary easement. This is a temporary easement issue, correct? There, there are two easements requested from, from Sauger. There is a permanent easement. Um, that was the sliver parcel that she was referring to. And then there is a temporary easement that is larger for grading purposes and the reconstruction of the stone masonry wall that she referred to. Yes. Um, I just want to point out on, on the plans that, that are here, um, this is the existing back of walk out here, if you can see my cursor moving. Mm -hmm. The existing county layout is actually back here, so several feet away. I unfortunately can't measure it off of the PDFs to confirm. Um, but um, as she stated, there are um, some trees, shrubbery, and a masonry retaining wall. The, the trees and the retaining wall are located within the public right-of-way. The trees are proposed to be removed as well as the bushes which are right above the wall and the plan is to remove and reset her retaining wall back at the, the layout line, the existing right-of-way line. And Ray, to your point, when, when, when work is done in, in the right-of-way, the appraisers can take that into account as they assess the value of the easements, et cetera. Well, right? the question for the appraiser is what what is the um, value of the property with and without the project? Okay. And um, so anything that's going on um, in the project, if, if, with respect to property that is clearly being taken, um, so I want to make that point very clear that if, if if your property is not being taken and there, there's something going on in the public right of way, you don't get you don't get you don't get compensation for that. But if your property is being taken, some portion of it is being taken, then the question for the appraiser is what is the value of the property with the project versus without the project? And other things that are going on in that project can go into that appraisal. I'm not a professional appraiser, but that's um, uh, and the town has a, an appraisal firm that is doing that work. But that's conceptually what's going on. Okay. So if I could, Mr. Chair, so in terms of trying to get some specific answers for you, we can't get them tonight. We hear what you're saying. We're going to look at that. That doesn't necessarily mean that the town can do anything. I don't know yet, but we'll certainly absolutely look at that. Um, you raised a couple of other points that I think are going to be somewhat general to others. And um, uh, certainly we're in the 38 question and answer uh, uh, document that we received. Uh, and, and this you may not want to hear, we've been talking about this work for 20 years in Hopkinton, if not 30 years. And it starts with that intersection getting changed, right, in the main, right out here, the main street intersection. And it goes up to Wooden West Main, and it goes out to the Common. So this has been going on forever. We've had multiple town meeting votes about this. <coughs> our board implements what town meeting says to do. That's our job. So we can't change town meeting, okay? Our job is to do the best we can with what we have to work with based on the articles past the town meeting where decisions were made about doing the project, decisions were made about funding the project, et cetera. So all that water is way under the bridge. And that's unfortunate if you're just picking up on this now or getting into this now. I don't know when you purchased your house or how long you've been there, but this has been going on forever. And for those that are frustrated that they didn't know, 
You know, we live, in a, we live in what's called a pure democracy here in Hopkinton, and then it's a town meeting form of government. I, Everybody uh, gets the vote. I can't find anything that references the left lane turn on West Main. Okay, I'm going to get to that. But I'm just talking about the general concept of lack of transparency. Right. I don't know how much more transparent we can be about a project that's been going on for 20 years. So for those that are going to argue lack of transparency, with all due respect, you just, it's not going to go very if far. If you don't tell people that it personally affects them, and then you hit them with a, a letter, a certified letter, asking them to donate their property, that's a lack of transparency. There's been no mention of 5 West Main. And I support all the other people that are here as well. But like, no one said anything about this. I've lived in town for a number of years. I've bought my mother's house. So I'm not new to the whole thing. It's just that all of a sudden, guess what? You're going to have another lane of traffic in your front yard. And I, by the way, on question number 31, when you responded to the question about the left lane turn, you don't even mention 5 West Main. You say this will be better for 1 West Main and 125 Main Street, but you don't even mention 5 West Main, which is going to have a new traffic lane in its front yard. Okay, so covered the transparency piece. Back to the left-hand lane question. I can't answer that sitting here. I don't think any of my colleagues can answer that. But we need to get an answer on that one. Uh, Amanda, please, what can be done there, if anything? I don't know. We don't need it tonight. Tonight's mm -hmm. about understanding people's frustration and what their harms, what they feel are their harms. And then we're going to get back to them, OK? But we'll never get through this tonight if we're going to try to address it in here. No, and I understand that. And we'll definitely go back to the office and discuss and if we can enhance the the response to that, um, there, there might be other options that we can consider as far as enhancing her driveway and making sure that, you know, we can that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Jacqueline St. Clair, 84 Main Street. Um, Thank you to the select board for listening to us and allowing us to air what are our growing concerns. To your point about the lack of transparency, my husband and I have lived here for 19 years. Um, similar to Ms. Auger, our first uh, touch point as citizens on Main Street was receiving a certified letter in Auckland, April. Yes, we've heard about the project for years, and yes, we had been excited about the project for years, but certain elements of, of what was going on had been left out uh, for the hearing of, of those who were readily affected. Um, as I mentioned, we lived here for 19 years, and indeed, it's a, it's a great place to live. And our first, as a matter of fact, our first introduction to Hopkinton was when we gave a courtesy call to the police department to tell them when we were moving in. And the police said, oh, not that day, not that day, because that's marathon day. Now, mind you, so, so yeah, we, we, we likewise got a chunk out of our initial introduction. But since then, we've hosted what, 18 open houses, marathon open houses, for runner friends and friends of friends, all of whom commented on what a great place this is, how welcoming it is, how charming it is. Um, and our house, 84 Main Street, looks out on 85 Main Street, that absolutely gorgeous old high school there that's full of businesses. And across the years, we've seen a lot of businesses come and go for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, some of it's bad business planning, okay. But as I see it, this project is just complicating things, not only for homeowners, for, but for businesses. And, and as for the impact to me, to us, to, to Main Street, those two are intertwined. Um, when, you know, when we initially got the notice, personal impact to our properties, we're being asked to give easements on approximately 1,000 square feet, either a temporary or per permanent easement. Now, over the course of the years, we don't have children, so over the course of the years, you know, we've done things out of consideration for the town. We voted for new schools, and we voted for, you know, parks. We voted for, I don't know, playgrounds. All, all because it was for the good of the community. And likewise, when we got this initial request for a donation, we thought, 
okay, it's a thousand feet, it's for the good of the community, but subsequent to that, questions have been unanswered. And now they're, they're just continuing to grow. And these questions were not part of any of the original open forums that I'm aware of. And granted, I'm, I'm guilty as the next person of not attending some of those open forums, but I've learned a lot since. Um, the documents that we received, and here, what do I know about legalese and about building construction, but the documents that, that we received were confusing to me because if they speak of at least two construction cycles, however those are measured, but they're asking us for a temporary easement of at least five years. So I'm assuming that the time frame is somewhere between one and five years that businesses, houses in the area are going to be impacted. Again, as I'm thinking about 85 Main Street, other businesses like Phipps, about the new businesses in town, the Muffin House, Central Public, old businesses in town, how they're going to be impacted by things such as traffic. Recently, we had relatives who were coming into town. It took them, because of construction, 30 minutes from the time they got off 495 to our house. That's a mile and a quarter. The only reason they continued they attempted to turn around, but the only reason they continued is because they knew our house was only a mile away. How many other people are going to say, it's just not worth it, I'm not gonna to go to Muffin House, I'll swing into Dunkin' Donuts, I'm not gonna to go to Bill's, I can go elsewhere. Businesses are going to be affected. And when those businesses are going to be affected, and as businesses are you know, empty, and you're seeing the four lease, four sale signs up, the property values of those individuals who are living in the downtown area are likewise affected. So indeed, it is intertwined, and it's disconcerting because of this lack of transparency. When we got the original set of documents, we asked for a meeting with Mr. Del Torrio. My husband met with him. We had just a couple of simple questions at that point in time. Just at that point, just all we wanted to know was where a light pole was going to be moved and why a guy wire was necessarily being placed on our property. He was going to get back to us. Approximately two weeks later, we received a second set of documents containing the exact same materials, again asking for a donation of our property. That was a little bit irritating. We've subsequently joined with others learn more about their questions and more about other questions that have gone unanswered, more about representations made about, there's one representation that said that all of the citizens, representation made, I don't know if it was on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, but assuring the select board that everybody had been contacted. We've never been contacted by anyone having to do with the Chamber of Commerce. So I don't know where that came from. So it just seems like there's a whole lot of things that haven't been made apparent to us that have continued to go unanswered. And yeah, I've been naive, but at this point in time, I'm taking off the rose-colored life is peachy glasses, and I want some answers. And I know that there's a bunch of people behind me that do too, particularly people who's whose properties are far more affected than not mine, than ours is. Um, yeah, we were thinking about the possibility of selling within the next few years. But basically our property is going to be tied up potentially for however long this construction project goes on and if indeed we lose businesses in the downtown area for however long it takes us to rebuild those businesses. Just because it makes us, for that period of time, a little less attractive. So yeah, I've, I've got concerns. And to your point, with all due respect, Mr. Hare, I don't find that there's a whole lot of transparency in the project. There's, a, there's plans, there's words, but I'm not too sure that the two match up and they certainly are not answering our questions. But thank you for listening. Thank you. 
Mr. Chair, if I could. Yes. Mr. Mayor, why did we use the word donation in this letter? Um, I think there was a uh, belief on the part of um, uh, the project proponents that the uh, that for some property owners the project would be deemed to be so beneficial um, um, in terms of enhancing the value of their property that they as opposed to uh, the value of what they would be giving up that they rather um, um, go the simplest method uh, and simply donate it. Uh, understand the legal obligation of the town is to pay just compensation. That's embodied in the U.S. Constitution and the Massachusetts Constitution. We can't, we have to pay the fair market value of what's being taken. Somebody wants to, wants to um, donate that because they perceive that the uh, uh, that the value of what's being donated is less than, than the enhancement to their property, that's certainly a judgment that they could make, and we'd certainly like them to, uh, people to consider it. But that's the reason uh, uh, that, that was put in that letter. Um, so the, the, the word donate and donation has caused a lot of angst and frustration, and I can certainly understand why. I, for one, do not support donating. I never did. I was never asked about the word donation. I don't believe that's right. I think we follow the Constitution of the state and the United States, and we pay due, you know, just compensation for the for the easements. So this this notion that we're still asking for donation, I, I, as one member, I'm out with that. I'm not voting, supporting, whatever donation. I don't even know if I can do anything about that right now. Because you do get your just compensation, and you will get your just compensation. So if the t the concept of donation is driving you crazy. We recognize that that was a mistake and that's not what we're seeking going forward. So. May I start? Sure. Good evening, thank you for having us. My name is Sandra Ward. I'm here on behalf of the family at 67 Main Street. I would like to just speak briefly about select member Harry's first question. What is the harm that this project would cause downtown residents? For my family, the emotional and financial cost of living in a construction zone and operating a business during the estimated several year long construction period is immeasurable. When running a small business, you expect a certain amount of adversity in the sense of competition or recession, but you should not have to worry about your own town preventing you from conducting business for a beautification project. Imagine if you've operated a business for decades only to have such a project threatened to destroy that business by restricting customer access, eliminating on-street parking, and placing an easement over your entire private parking area. You say that no one has pointed out the harm yet. We have. The town just has not listened. Thank you. Mr. Kamal, how many years is this construction project going to take place? The, the We've been Yes, we've been advised that um, this will uh, cover two construction seasons. And I think the question has been asked before regarding the five years. Uh, the explanation is, is simple. Um, we accounted for one year for the design phase. We accounted for um, an additional two years for the construction. And then the remaining period is the warranty period. If there's work that needs to be done to fix anything that doesn't grow or grading that doesn't hold, we want the town to be able to come back and do that. So let's define what a construction season is. In Massachusetts, it's typically April 1 through November 30, somewhere in that, correct, and it shuts down during the winter months? It, it, that's correct. It varies, depends on the weather conditions, depends on the work that's being performed, but generally, that's correct. So I like, I mean, I like the thought of the, I, I spoke to Mr. Kamalu about the five-year easement versus generally they do a three-year easement. And the, the five-year easement is when they put electrical from the street to your house, uh, if, they're, if they put it in at the end of the construction, they ha then it has a few months on a three-year easement, a few months to 
um, be under, quote, warranty. A five-year says in, if in four and a half years after, the, uh, after the, the service goes underground, the trench that they dug has sunk, the stone wall that they built has crumbled, um, the pavement that they put down has, is not to spec, they're still liable for those extra two years. Um, so when it comes to a three to a five year, as someone who is a property owner, I would rather, now I don't have any intentions of moving, but I would rather be able to say in four and a half years, I would, I would like to be able to call and say, hey, that trench that you, that, you, uh, that you ran down my yard to connect the power underground versus over is now eight inches low and I'm gonna need 15 yards of loom and grass seed and fertilizer and it's gonna look horrible, I, I need it fixed. I'd rather be able to go to the town for that than, than, um, than have to be on the hook for that myself. But, and, and I don't know, there, there's, there are a lot of people pulling from the center of this project, uh, pros and cons, and you know, we're definitely listening to, to all, the, all the, uh, the, the, what the people have to say. Uh, but like Mr. Hur said, this, a lot of the stuff is out of our hands because it was voted on at town meeting. Um, and a lot of it is before a lot of the people here were property owners. Now, obviously, uh, the wards, they've been here forever, and, and, uh, and, and not to diminish the people who recently bought in Hopkinton uh, or recently acquired their address in Hopkinton, that, that their concerns are no more valid than uh, the wards because they've been here longer. You know, it's not everybody's equal, uh, but like Mr. Hurst said, we, we are, we're trying to kind of make the best out of it and, and steer it. Dave, will there be any parking eliminated during the construction process itself? In particular, in the center of town at Main and Grove, where we've got a couple of businesses, obviously access to those businesses will always be maintained. We cannot close off a driveway. We cannot close off a road. That's not going to happen. We cannot stop people from moving in and out of their properties. But are we going to take away par parking spaces while this construction goes on? Yeah, while construction activities are going on in that area, uh, there'll be some restricted access to that on-street parking. Okay. Temporary. That, in my view, is a harm. That is a harm to any business in the center of town that relies on two or three spots to conduct their business. So if we're going to eliminate those spots during construction, we need to address that somehow. I don't know how we do that, yeah, only, but that, that to me is a harm. Right, I mean, it's not limiting it for the entire construction process. It's right. while the activities are going on directly adjacent to that space. Okay, so when they're going on directly to that space, that's a harm. And that's something I think to be fair to everybody, we need to figure out a solution to that harm. And it, yeah, and, and I'm, not, I'm not sure it's physically possible to, to dig a trench in front of it through a, a parking space without if I'm, if I'm understanding, <laughs> like but right now there's a gas line that's being yeah. excavated right, right along the, the edge of the, say, the travel way in the parking space. While that trench is being excavated, you, you, you can't physically get to that parking space in the park. Okay, so for and those the three days day, we do that trench, right. and the revenue lost is $750, $1,500, whatever the number is, that needs to be taken care of in life. I'm not telling you that. I'm just having a dialogue here. <laughs> Dave, write a check for fifteen hundred bucks. This is the kind of thing we need to sort through. That's a harm. I think that's a legitimate thing that the, this board should support taking care of. Somehow. So to piggyback on that, I absolutely agree that when a when a construction project eliminates oh, the ability to for for customers to get into that small business or large business. I absolutely agree that it's a harm and that there should be probably some compensation for it. I don't think that if, uh, if we were doing the Main Street Corridor project in front of EMC, I, I think if we shut them down for three or four days, I don't think that they would say, ah, it's really no big deal. What do I need these 10,000 people to come into my, my business for and, and, and do business? Well, to me, it's just a matter of scale. It's still that person at EMC who works at EMC who can't get to work it's the same thing as John Ward or, or, or uh, Phipps or, 
uh, CVS or any of these people that aren't able to access it. So, so there is a harm. There's a direct hit to their wallet. To the homeowner, no, because no matter what, you're going to be able to get out of your driveway. It might take you a little bit longer, but you're going to be able to get out of your driveway. But where it absolutely adversely affects the businesses, and by businesses, I don't mean the fire department, I don't mean the police department, because they're going to be able to get out regardless. But if, if um, John Catino is coming from Elizabeth Road and he wants to go get a haircut at John Ward's house, he's going to have to figure out where he's going to park. And it, he's going to be able to figure it out. But there are a lot of people that may say, you know what, the hell with that, I'm going to go to Supercuts. It's 10 minutes down the road and I can get a bottle of wine right next door. Um, and it, that, has, that has direct adverse um, reaction for his business, as well as potentially long, long term. Not that any supercuts can give a better haircut than John Ward, I'll tell you that. Right now, he does mine, so. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, just to follow up, the, the appraisal process includes a review of loss of parking in a sense. I, mm -hmm. I haven't been through that entire process with, with the appraisal company yet, but we can certainly follow up with them and ask them about, you know, typically that's private parking loss. They'll come up with the value of that impact. I can look into what that process can be, uh, what could possibly be, or be included in the appraisal process for a loss of on street parking and, and see if they've done that before. I mean, it's not going to be for that two year period, there's two construction cycles, but it's going to be intermittent at times of up and down, you know, in various in two front weeks. of businesses, really. Two weeks. Yeah, so I, I, I want to accommodate for that, and I think that's the right thing, and I think that residents of Hopkinton, who we represent, would support that too. So we just got to figure that piece out. Again, not going to figure it out here tonight, but on our list of things we want to look at. Mr. Kamalo, do, oh, you know, um, can we look at at uh, some temporary parking measures or something? Is there some deals we can make with people, or you know, other businesses, or uh, some small purchases, or some leases during during construction? We can. look at it but so what I'm trying to think of some of the businesses so I think of wards I think of FIPS I think of bills I think of these other places what are you gonna do you're gonna well, we have we have uh, we have like 10, 10 spaces behind the uh, behind the fire station 15 spaces you know what I mean? right. there's some just just so we'll look into it. Throw one out there you can look into that right yeah we can look I think that's would help, but I don't think that addresses no, the specific but, harm. It's the specific harm of what we're, we're trying to ferret out tonight. I know everyone's mad at me for bringing it up. The reason I brought it up is to get you out here to tell me what the issues are so we can try and solve them for you. Um, there's a method to my madness, believe me. So, and it's really this, this, you know, monetary impact that I think is, is what we're, we have to be really fair about. And to some extent, you know, Maybe that conversation has been had today. The time is ticking here, and we're going in the ground here next spring. So, I think when we're looking at the monetary impact, it's not just those two weeks. It's also, you know, the person who would normally drive by and have a spot. When he doesn't have that spot, is he going to continue to think to come back, or is he going to think, okay, well the Everyone doesn't know that it's only two weeks. Um, so it's hard to quantify what the lost future business is, um, if any, or maybe it's significant. I don't know. But uh, the person who just kind of drives by and says, ah, I can't get in there, doesn't go back for a year. Doesn't go back for, you know, how long? So I think we need to, we need to consider that and as, we're, as we're looking at this. Guiding the appraisers, I think, is going to be very important in this process. Yeah. Guiding the appraisers in a legally proper and appropriate manner is going to be important in this process. I don't know how you do that, but I think the, the, the instructions the community gives about the project obviously have to line up with state norms and everything, but I think that we've got to give some kind of directive there. Is that possible, Mr. Mayors? Well, it's certainly possible to, uh, to give guidance. Um, 
there's plenty of case law out there because people have been litigating um, eminent domain takings for ever. Um, and so there's plenty of, um, uh, of case law guiding how various kinds of impacts um, are to be valued. Um, and if we want to, um, if, if you're suggesting that, that the town wants to do better than what the minimum amount that the law requires is, we, we need to come up with some additional guidance to reflect that. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Harrow. Ed Harrow in Spring Lane. Thank you for this. I appreciate it. I have been trying for multiple years to talk to people on some kind of a reasonable basis about the bike lane thing. And here, thanks to Norman, I have two opportunities in one week. It's really <laughs> quite spectacular. So, to be clear, I have a bike history that goes on quite a long ways. This is my great great aunt and uncle on their tandem tricycle in Central Park, 1890. Not a direct butter to Main Street in Hopkins, right. but moving forward. <laughs> this is my father with his 1938 Schwinn Paramount that he bought from my great uncle in his bike shop. This is my mother on my grandfather's high wheeler. My parents met biking. So it's like pretty genetic. I've been riding for about 65 years. When I was, when I was about five. I've been on at least three continents. Now maybe with Brexit, it'll be four. I'm not sure. I'm 71. I talk about, how do, how do I phrase that? The older I get, the faster I walk. I've only done about 1,000 miles this year. I'm not riding as much. I worked in the bike industry for 10 years. I traveled over half the planet. I talked about bicycle promotion and bicycle safety. And the basics of my safety lecture were, one, be where you're expected to be. That means if the traffic's going this way, you're going this way. Be predictable. Do what you're expected to do. This is basic rules of the road, which I will readily point out that bicycle riders generally don't pay too much attention to. Understand that you are invisible. Anyone who rides a bicycle or rides a motorcycle knows all about this. Somebody looks right at you and they pull out in front of you or they make a left turn in front of you. There were two studies done, one by a guy named Nesser and about 1975, and another by Simon Zuchabri in the late 90s, of what is called in, in, inattentional blindness, i.e., I look at you and I don't see you. Some here may be aware of the study. They had a room, and the subject sat there and watched what was going on. What was going on was a group of people with a basketball. And the subject was told to count the number of times the ball was passed from person to person. In the middle of all this, a person walked through dressed as a gorilla, or perhaps it was a person with an umbrella, and people didn't see it by and large because they weren't looking for that. When you were five years old and running across the street, you were told to look both ways for cars. <clears throat> when you're driving in your car today and you look both ways, you're looking for cars. You're not looking for bicycles. You're not looking for motorcycles. So what's this got to do with the bike lane? I have asked repeatedly to find one bike lane anywhere, not just Massachusetts, I don't care, that was an urban setting, and we can argue about is this an urban setting, with similar terrain, a 6.75% slope going up from 85 towards the library with multiple curb cuts. We, have, we can argue about the numbers. We have about 30 curb cuts for about three quarters of a mile. I haven't seen it yet. I have gotten some pictures. Dave Galterio's worked hard at this. Here's one. Here's two.
is three. And it's quarter of ten. Yep, is four. Sum it up, buddy. Let's go. Let's get moving. Here's six. Every one of them is flat as a billboard. That is not what we're talking about in downtown Hopkinton. Recently released study by the Institute of Highway Safety, Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. Two-way bike lanes, separated bike lanes are crossed an average of six times a mile, not 30 times and three quarters of a mile. The increase in junctions increases risk. Where a two-way separated bike lane is installed on one side of a street, the contraflow direction of bicycle travel introduces an unexpected movement at intersections. That's a quote from the Mass DO2 Separated Bike Lane Planning and Design Guide of 2015. The design guides for protected bike lanes recommend using high visibility markings with driveways as well as restricting parking 23, 20 to 30 <coughs> feet prior to the driveways. Massachusetts actually goes up to 60 feet depending on speed, but that wouldn't be the case here. We're not going to have 20 to 30 feet between parked cars and driveways. I was taken to task by a party from, from VHP at Tuesday's meeting, and so I'm curious. We have a study here. It was done in 2014. The data was from 2008 to 2012. Is there a more current study? I rest my case. And if I sound like I've got some heart in this, Norman knows. I know. Yep. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. You've been pretty passionate about this since, since I can remember this project being uh, brought up. How you doing? Good. How are you? Uh, I'm John Forster. I own the property at 43 Main Street, the Muffin House. Yep. And the plan I seen when I went to the meeting down in the basement here was not a temporary uh, loss of those park, like a permanent loss of the parking spaces because of the, the bike lane. And that's my main concern is that you know, the business surviving. Sure. You know, not just during construction, but those yep. spaces gone uh, permanently. Sure. Yeah, so I, I know that we're um, in the in process of putting a, you know, a parking lot actually right, right by there, right? I mean, that's that Chuck Joseph property that the town mm -hmm. agreed to fund and uh, that should be I, I don't think it'll be there for the uh, I, I'm quite sure it won't be there for the for the downtown revitalization but there are going to be a, a bunch more spots there uh, very soon we hope you said get behind um, behind the rectory there yeah. that lot that Chuck Joseph's how many spots right is behind there? your building yeah but but Dave, is he losing both parking spaces in front of his building? There's only there's only one. Um, the, one there are there are you know there are spaces being lost. There's um, one directly in front and two right before it. That the plan that I looked at here showed because of the bike lane was gone. And the, you know the the attempts to redesign um, to address that. You know originally we had three lanes coming westbound. Um, that was reduced to two lanes. We were able to add parking in front of, I don't know it's across the street, but in front of Hopkinton Drug where there are none right now. Um, and we were able to maintain uh, a couple more spaces in front of um, the restaurant. Um, what's the restaurant? One, ten, um, Central House. Central House. Um, originally, I think we had four there, but uh, we were able to get a fifth one back. Um, in that part of the right of way, um, it's, it's, it's narrow. And there's no way to include. And when we do the new parking space. lot, where will those spaces be in proximity to his building? Are they directly behind his building on the left side there? I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what, what I don't recall the properties that's being proposed. For Chuck Joseph? It would be to, to the right of his property. I'm sorry? It would be to the right of his property. So if you're facing his right. building, it's, it's to the right. There's a driveway right there. No, if you're facing his it's property, it's to the left. It's to the left. To the left. Yeah, facing the left. your property, to the left, there'll be a driveway yeah. right abutting your property going back, and the parking will be right there. <clears throat> 20 spaces or so, right? 16 30, spaces? 32. 32. Yeah, there's more than that. Yeah. And I know, um, so that's, let me just finish that thought. So that, that new parking lot, has been negotiated with the developer of that land back there. Yeah. 
and town meeting approved that this year. And so that is in the works to get built. Um, I don't know where we are in that process. Maybe Mr. Kamala can answer that, but that parking is coming to downtown Hopkinton. And then across the street, not involving the Bills parking lot directly, which we've talked about a little bit, but elsewhere back here, we're adding another 50. 30. 30. 30 spaces back here, so it's 60 some total. Okay. Uh, there's additional parking going on back here, but to your question about your building, there's going to be new parking right there. All right, that was my concern. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sean Harris. I live at 86 Main Street. Um, I just have a few concerns. My front yard is very small and I have a big driveway. Currently, there is barely enough yard space to put the snow during the storm. As of now, I fill up a full wheelbarrow of salt and sand off the top of my lawn every year. I can only imagine how much worse it would be with more pavement and less lawn. Also, I really do not want <coughs> Main Street any closer to my living room. When my front windows are open, the noise, vibration, and exhaust from the traffic bothers me. I also want to know what the plan is for the telephone call in front of my house. <coughs> there is no way I want it moved uh, onto my small front lawn. It is also very surprising to me that the Main Street Corridor Project has been in the planning since 2010, and most of us did not find out about it until we got the letter in April of 2019. That's it. That was quick. <laughs> yeah. So, so can we try so the, the telephone pole? Where's that one? Yes. So, so this is your property here, sir? Yeah. So the telephone pole right now is located um, kind of partially in the curb and in the roadway. It's being relocated to the back of sidewalk in the public right of way. So there is a permanent utility easement being requested. Um, that is not for the physical pole to be placed on your property. The pole will remain within the public right of way. But we are asking uh, for five feet for aerial clearance so that when there's an issue down the road and they need to make repairs to the lines, they have aerial clearance for the utility companies to come in and make repairs to the overhead wires. Um, there's also a temporary easement requested at your property that is for grading work on your property, including um, your driveway and the two-bit walkways, the bituminous pavement, hot mix asphalt pavement. Um, the edge of road directly in front of your property is essentially staying in the same location as is the back of walk, so there won't be um, additional like walk in front of your driveway. It will <coughs> be roughly going in the same location at your particular residence. So where's the pole going to be moved to? The pole will be moved to the back of walk. So it will increase. Closer to your house. It'll be, it'll be closer to your house, but it will be in, in I mean, the It's right, it's right on the edge of the, you know, the, the it's, it's in right the, on it's, the edge of my lawn, well, on the sidewalk, pretty much, you know? Um, the, this pole, or is it, are you talking about? Yeah, there's only one pole. So the pole, the pole's on the edge of the road? Yeah, it's on the edge of the road, yeah. Yeah. So it's going to be on the other side of the sidewalk? Yeah, so it'll be on my land? Correct. Oh, okay. Um, okay, but it's not your land. Yeah, right. Yeah. All right. Um, and I'll address the sand. They don't use sand anymore. They use salt. Just salt. No more sand. Well, I don't know. Every time um, I snowblow the drift, it's all it's all melted snow from. Yeah. It's got to be salt. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I've been doing it for 25 years. Yeah. No more sand. Okay. When did this happen? A couple of years ago. Oh, okay, yeah, because it's just like a big pile of slush when I snow yep. blow, so it's obviously been salt. Yep. And I've, and I've used my blower, like I said, and filled up my wheelbarrow yep. almost every year with just sand, and you know, and that's why I really wouldn't want that. Yep. You know. Sure. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So why don't we close this meeting? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 Thank you. Thank you very much for having us here. I'm Jackie Potenzoni, 12 Wood Street. And I probably am the most educated member of the corridor regarding this plan. And yes, I am the individual 
that filed multiple Freedom of Information Acts, starting with when this project started. Because in 2011, I got notified by one of my customers that the town was proposing a second lane added, a third lane added in front of my house. So there was a town, there was a meeting from the disc, disc committee way back when, you were on the committee, Brian, at one point, and they were presenting multiple plans that were happening in front of my house. And one of the plans presented was to buy to West Main Street and put a third lane in front of my house. Same thing that's happening to me. Well, I was never notified of any of these plans back in 2011. When I went to the first public meeting at the high school, three plans were presented and they said, I, they said that the plan to add the third lane in front of my house wasn't the main option and that wasn't what they really were going to go forward with. That was in November of 2011. Well, in December of 2011, the, the Downtown Initiative Steering Group and everybody was on the bandwagon about the third lane. Well, I found out through the Freedom of Information that the town actually talked to those residents before the public hearing. So if we want to talk about transparency in this plan, there hasn't been transparency with the residents since the beginning. And I am living proof of that, what I've gone through. <coughs> I just want to point out to you, Brian, back in 2012, before we went to town meeting, there was an item on that town meeting to buy to West Main Street. And you supported that article because you said if we took that whole town easement in front of that property, that that house would be unlivable to those residents and you didn't support that. I don't know if it was at the selectman meeting or if it was at the disc joint meeting with the board of selectmen and the, the disc committee. I remember those words coming out of your mouth. I remember saying it. Okay, so but now what you're doing to Mimi is exactly what you said you wouldn't support to West Main Street. So that's hypocritical. I'm sorry. I'm yeah, we'll save that debate okay. for a You can yeah. talk after. I want to finish so, what I have to say. So, Jackie, just for civility, why don't you just go through me? Okay, thank you. Brendan, in 2014, Norman created the Downtown Initiative Center Group because there was a lot of disdain in town. And that disdain was created by this individual. And I'm very happy that I did because I got awareness to the plan. The biggest reason I sat in Golden Signs. Nobody knew about the plan. I'm a hairdresser. I volunteered in every organization in this town. Okay? Nobody knew what was going on. And how I started carrying my signs was because it was in the winter. And I wanted to put a sign in front of my house, but I couldn't hammer it in the ground. So I said, the hell with it. I'm going to put it on and walk with it. I lost 25 pounds, and I made awareness to the plan. So Norman created this committee that we never had a meeting. And Norman, you said, you appointed me to the committee. Through me, Jack, me. Jackie, through me. I'm sorry. I know, I'm very emotional I know. about this. I get you. Norman Stay created the committee so we could have community input. The vacancies have never been filled, and the committee still stands not one meeting. That was what the whole goal of this committee was for, was transparency. So if we want to talk about transparency, let's start here. I was told in 2017, nothing was changing in front of my house, everything was fine. When I, I went to town meeting in 2018, I was there and I saw Article 47 and all those, all those plot, plot numbers. And I didn't think I was on it because I was told by the town manager that I'm not on the plan, you have nothing to worry about, he said to me. Well, that wasn't true at all because my property was in fact on Article 47 and if I had known, if my address was on that list, I would have got up at town meeting and I would have spoke. And I have a feeling the will of town meeting would have been a different town vote if people knew what was, who, were, who were being affected and what was really going to affect residences. So please, the, none of the residents that were on that town meeting were, received a letter that the town meeting was going to have their, their property on it or anything. Whether, it's, whether they followed the letter of the law, they didn't follow the spirit of law, the law or the spirit of Hoppington. Because that's not what Hoppington is all about. I've lived here for 20 years. 
I've been a 19 year business owner. And Dave Tiltari, I'll never forget Dave, what he said to me when I was so upset. I kept going into the, to town hall. 2012, I asked for my driveway meeting. It was granted to me in 2017. Took me five years to get the meeting. And when this all started, I went in and I spoke. Norman keeps telling everybody, talk to Dave. Dave's only doing his job. He said, oh, we never looked across the street. And I'm like, and honestly, I have to tell you. So my next question is, the town attorney said at town meeting, when you took no action on Article 52, that we have to reaffirm the easement vote in order to go forward. Has there been a date for town meeting to be set? Because that's a very important question. In order to go forward, is that true? You have to reaffirm Article 47 to go forward with the e easements to get funding? No. No. You don't? No. How, why did you have to reaffirm it um, last year? We didn't. We didn't. Mm. Why was it there then? Because we were trying to ascertain whether it was going to be necessary. So we, in, because we have to close the warrant before we had the answer to that question, we put the, um, the question, we put it on the warrant while we investigated with the MassDOT whether they were going to require us to do it again. And as I explained at town meeting, there was no need to take any additional uh, vote. And so, the, so no vote was taken. So it was kind of a placeholder while they did the investigation. I misunderstood that. I thought we had to have another town meeting. So what you may you may have through through you, Mr. Chair, the what you may have heard is that after the project is completely done, those easements, the permanent easements that have been acquired for the purpose of the right of way, will will then become part of the layout of the public way, and there will need to be a town meeting vote to transform those easements into part of the layout of the right-of-way. I, I just don't understand. There was never community involvement for the people affected, and I tried to create that. That's why this group was, this committee was created, and I don't know. Can somebody tell me why it was never filled? Why we never had this Norman, you wrote me a nice letter. And I really was happy to be part of the solution because we had a very, very ugly town meeting. And I, I live downtown. I wanted to be part of the solution, but because I was a vocal opponent of it, you didn't want to hear what I had to say. And that's not right either. You only want to hear what people have to say around with that. Say, rah, 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 you're great. Well, these people tonight aren't saying, rah, 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 you're great. And there's other people that couldn't be here tonight because it was short notice. Can you please answer me, Brendan, to Norman, why wasn't this committee ever filled? Mr. Koala. I threw the chair. Um, we did advertise for the committee. You stepped forward and joined the committee. And no other people joined, stepped forward to do that. And simultaneously, the project then moved to the 25% design phase. And at that point, the committee that was responsible for the project became the board of the select board. But there was advertisements continually through the years that this committee wasn't on it. You didn't and advertise it this past year or the following, the year prior. Because in prize there were no there were no people still we didn't have anybody stepping forward I to mean, join. If you had called me, I would have probably found more people to get on the committee. Yeah. And in fact, if I may throw the chair, um, you have in, in past instances referred to my visit to your property with Dave, Elaine and John. You are absolutely correct. I told you at that meeting that your property was not part of the parcels identified for easement. I want you to know, at that point, I did not know. And I think you have seen it even from the emails that you requested from us, that the only time I became aware of the inclusion of your property was just before the annual town meeting. Then why wasn't I contacted? And 
in March of 19, all the plans prior to that didn't have my property on it. Yeah. And I was a very involved citizen. In, in fact, through the chair. Through the chair. It, to answer your question, why were you not contacted? You became aware of the inclusion of your property when the letters went out. So that was the contact made. I'm sorry, I missed that. Yes. She became aware of the inclusion of your property when the letter advising her of the easement went out. Or was sent to her. That was in April, but the town, the fact the town submitted the seventy-five percent design in March. Yeah. At that point, I did not know. I think I've clarified that point, and also uh, you provided us evidence of a memo that came from Master OT. It is pretty clear that was an inter-office memo. It was not sent to the town. I want you to know that. I find that really hard to believe. I really, really do. You Sincerely, I find that extremely hard to believe. And I just want you all to know that I, in March, had a cardiac issue. And I was pretty sick, and I almost died. And I have been involved in this plan since day one. So when I was going through cardiac rehab and I was recovering, getting that letter of donation was not what I needed to get. I only had 10 days to prepare for town meeting, to swing into action and say to the corridor folks, let's go, we have to start working again to save our private property rights. And how the town handled it is not in the spirit of what this town is. This is a great town. This is a wonderful place to live. And we have a crisis in our schools. And I'd like to just point out to the Board of Selectmen, when I sat and watched the slide tonight, we really have a crisis. And for you to stand there and nickel and dime the school system, that's what makes Hawkington so great, is the schools. You need to step back and think about needs and wants and spending money. This car project is going to be the 800 pound gorilla when it comes down and it's going to cost more and it's going to end up being, there's going to be overtures and overruns. We have a school issue that has an enrollment surplus that we have to address as a community and we're going to have to spend an awful lot of money on the school. So this, this select board has to make a decision on needs versus wants. And we need to address bigger issues, and this Carter project is not a main issue. It's taking away people's private property rights. It's going to devalue properties. It's going to make properties not available to sell while there's an easement process and a construction zone. And there's a lot of people on the corridor that do want to sell their house in the next five years. And it's just not right. And I hope you think about that going forward. You talked a lot about finance tonight. Kelly, Five Ash Street. You talked a lot about finance tonight, and when there are 90 property owners, residences, and businesses contact contacted in April to donate their property, and only three properties were donated. Where is the money going to come to pay off all these easements? So I guess that kind of leads me to one of my questions is, you know, Brian was talking about fair and equitable, um, you know, payment for if they don't want to donate. If they don't want to donate for a temporary easement, do we have a ballpark of, of what, a, what the compensation would be on a temporary easement? No? We, we, the appraisal report is not complete yet, and we cannot speculate on the amount. Is it a hundred grand a property? We cannot speculate, Brian. Is it a million dollars a property? <laughs> we hope it's not. <laughs> okay, I need you to work with us a little bit here. We're trying to solve yes. a few questions. If it's not a hundred grand a property, I don't it's not a million dollars a property, and it's not five bucks a property, you know, we got to understand the scale of it. There's, there's, there's some 
conversation in the community that we're a million dollars short and it's going to go to three million dollars short and yada yada yada. That's fake news to use a term that I don't like. Um, but people are just making stuff up as they go along. My sense is, so this is, I'm allowed to say whatever I want because I'm duly elected by the people I happen to, maybe you aren't. My sense is a temporary easement might be worth 500 bucks. Yeah. That's my gut. Okay, and I've got some assessors and some other people that kind of chirp in my ear about maybe what that's worth. We're not talking about millions of dollars here for these, for these temporary easement payments. So it's not gonna break the bank financially. The job was budgeted. The job was applied for at state and federal levels to have funds necessary, if need be, for these easements. There's this suggestion that no, all the stones haven't been unturned. Every stone has been unturned here. We've looked at everything, we've studied everything, we're prepared to do what's right on behalf of the residents of Hopkinton. Please understand, there are 17,400 people outside this room living in Hopkinton. And I would venture to say 70% of them are saying, build it. So put yourselves in our shoes. We're not gonna argue with you about 500 bucks or a thousand bucks. If there's some property that's got a real problem, that's a real issue and the appraisal comes back and it's 10 grand, we're not gonna argue about it. I'm not anyways, one person. And I'm only speaking as myself here, not the rest of them. So I wouldn't get too hung up on the value of the appraisals, the value of the easements and whether you're gonna get screwed or not. Because as long as I'm sitting here, you're not. We're not gonna throw cash at, you know, into the wind here, well, we're going to be fair and equitable. And the notion that we're supposed to make decisions based on the input of 80 or 100, when 17,000 times 0.7 is, I don't know, 12,000 people, forget the kids, 8,000 people want us to build this project. I don't recall that time. Jackie, I am not debating you right now. I'm speaking as a member of the board of select. So if you're in our shoes, which you're welcome to dry and join, you're welcome to run for office next spring, you're welcome to run a year from, from then because I won't be on this board anymore, you're welcome to join. But if you're in our shoes and your job is to implement the will of town meeting, which is voted on this numerous times, and numerous times town meeting has been put out to the community to understand what's on the warrant, and numerous times we've had debates on town meeting floor about everything we've talked about here tonight. It's very frustrating for us too. We hate to see anybody pained by this project. But we also have 17,400 people out there saying build it. That is why I want to understand what the harm is so that we can make sure you are taken care of fairly by the rest of the 17,000 people. And they want that too, at least through this representative, they do. So work with us and we'll figure it out. The donation word never should have been used. I will apologize as one member sitting here, not on behalf of the town, but as one member that we use that word. I'm sorry. We're not gonna ask for a donation again. But we are gonna get going on this project. This is what people have to understand. Town meeting has said on several occasions, go. And that's what's happening. And now we gotta figure out to make sure that these harms are addressed that you guys have brought up tonight. And that's what we'll do. Question, please. Hold on, before you, before you come up, have a seat. I wanna make sure that everybody has, I'm not gonna let someone speak twice because we're up against it with the clock. So I wanna make sure that everybody's spoken that wants to speak before I, let any, before I consider anyone coming up for a second time. Is that it? There's nobody else here that wants to speak on the Main Street Corridor Project? I'll give you two minutes, Mr. Kelly. We hear 17,000 people and all that. One thing, read the Constitution, I think it's the Sixth Amendment about minority rights. But the other thing I want to know, what are we doing it for? What's the benefit? The harm here, the harm there, all the harm. What's the benefit? Somebody tell me the benefit, the project. What's the benefit? Any answers? Y yes, we can. Mr. Kamala. What's the benefit? We are addressing the traffic congestion. We're also uh, improving 
the accessibility to the downtown, accounting for, ac accounting for all modes of transportation. We are improving the landscaping along the corridor. Garden club can do that. Come on, man. No. Listen. Come on. Show them a little respect. I'm more important. Great. Yes. <laughs> and, and finally, um, we are building resilience into the electrical supply, supply uh, and other utilities in the downtown by undergrounding utilities. And how much is that going to cost? Dave, what is the total project cost now? The borrowing was for, for three million. The borrowing at that meeting was for three million. Yes. No. no what What is the total project cost? Everything in. Currently, it's what would about what was in the mass works grant. Yeah. Um, is it fifteen sixty? I mean, it changes every day, unfortunately. And the last time I think it was fifteen. Fifteen, 15 million. Million. And we're on the hook for three. Yeah. And we're on the hook for three. I rest my case, Holly. Fifteen million? Whoa! It's not going to cost us fifteen million. What? All right. Thank you. All right. So we are. Jane? Sure. Jane Moran, 7 East Main Street. This conversation reminds me a lot of the legacy farms. I don't want to go back in time, but I was in their shoes many years ago and dead opposed to legacy farms, but it passed. And now I honestly have to say that. I completely um, have embraced it, and I'm going forward um, with um, future plans for our town. And because of Legacy Farms, we have a huge growth in the population, and we have to address that. And that refers to everything that Mom just referred to. We have to improve our traffic. We have to improve our bike safety. We have to improve our sidewalks. We have to take care of all of our citizens. And um, you know, and I do feel bad for this, the short pain that you folks are going through. I went through what it's been eight years I've been through. Come on, you know, come on. No, no back and forth with them. You can't wait. But um, it was very similar. And I, I, I can only hope that at the end of the day that you embrace the downtown part of when it's all said and done as I have embraced Legacy Farms. Thank you. All right. <laughs> So I'm not directly impacted by the construction, but um, my heart is the businesses downtown that will be. Uh, I think the impact on them is going to be devastating. My sister is 5 West Main Street. It's unbelievable to think uh, where the street's going to be relative to her front, her front steps when this is all said and done, even though they're only taking five inches by 30 feet or something. The town technically owns 14.7 feet of what she thought was her front lawn, so it's it's going to be devastating to her and her property values too. So, uh, I, I, there's a couple of things. I understand that we have federal money, we have state money, but that will not pay for uh, the taking of property. And I'm wondering if we have any idea. I'm sure not too many people donated. Do we have any idea what the cost of the total taking of property is? Um, and, you know, that gets into, like, the cost benefit of it. Uh, that's the only reason I came up. I didn't think it was necessarily on topic. I was a project manager for a number of years. And uh, if, if a sponsor couldn't tell me what the problem was they wanted solved or what the opportunity was to take advantage of, I knew we were in a lot of trouble. A lot of risk to projects, and I see a, I see the potential for a great many of those risks in this project, but the biggest risk, I think, is when the sponsor just prescribes a solution where they can't really tell you in a very clear, concise way what the problem is they're trying to solve and how, the, how they intend to do it. Or rather, how the, the project will make that problem go away. And the biggest risk is, uh, to, to projects that I found is, is where the sponsor was prescribing solutions. And you could, you could complete the project on time, on budget, and when you measure the results afterwards and there's no change, you say, I spent $7 million for what? No, we did everything you told us to do. 
And this feels like really more than trying to solve a problem. I'm not hearing how any of these problems can be solved. I mean, if the original intent of this thing was to bury utility lines, okay, I could see that. All right, tell me why that's a big enough problem to spend money on. I understand it. Uh, but it seems to me uh, there's more like an opportunity right now to take advantage of federal and state money. And um, to me, that's not a good enough reason to spend any money of our own. That's like buying something on sale, you know, that's been knocked down by 90% that you don't need because it's a huge savings. Yes. If I may. Um, I think I hear and respect your position. Uh, it so happens that based on the phasing of the evolution of this project, we're now discussing funding. My understanding is that the town has been discussing these issues uh, regarding um, Main Street for many, many, many years. Uh, most recently, I ran into a master plan, I think that was done in 1957. Uh, I also read about the Conway study which identified most of the issues that are being discussed today way before the funding aspects came in. The focus currently seems to be on mass DOT and federal funding, or state and federal funding, simply because this is where the project is. But however, the ideas came from the community. That's yeah. my understanding. Right, yeah. yeah. Hey, downtown, is, it's rough getting through yeah. 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 around 4 o'clock. I understand that. Uh, I, I don't know that it's going to necessarily improve, mm -hmm. and if it does, I don't know how much we're willing to spend on it, but the, the town has approved this. And so I, I just hope that and when we have an opportunity to go for another town meeting, that we, we take a look at this project again from, you know, fresh eyes. Because it's 20 years old, there's all the more reason to do that. Oh. What problem are we trying to solve? How are we going to solve it? And, and that's all I'm asking is that we do that. So let's, let's not leave with any false hope, folks. And I know several of you look in the room at me as the bad guy here because I'm the one that speaks out the most about this whole situation. A uh, couple of thoughts. Town meeting votes with respect to this project are over. The project is moving ahead, okay? We need to make sure that we try to address the harms that people have articulated and any others that come up, okay? We're gonna try to figure this stuff out. I don't live on the west side of town. I live three blocks from here. I bought my house two months ago, knowing full well this was going to be a pain in the butt for the next three years. So while I don't feel the pain yet, I'm going to feel like a lot of other people in town feel it. I feel it trying to get back and forth with this little construction we had out here recently. It's been difficult. So I understand what's coming in Hopkinton in this corridor project because I've been at it for literally 19 years when I moved to town uh, and got on the planning board 19 years ago. Oh, we were talking about it then. But I bought my house anyway knowing what's coming because i believe on the other side of this we're going to have a beautiful downtown with a beautiful streetscape and people's property values are going to increase including mine i'm a business guy i get money i work hard for mine and i believe this is the right thing for hopkinton i really do believe that in my heart the short-term pain is going to be tough and we had this discussion tonight and I annoyed a few people a couple weeks ago to have this discussion tonight so that everybody had a chance to air their, their feelings about it. But the, the, the idea that we're going to look at this again at another town meeting, that's not going to happen. Well, my hope is that as estimates of the cost of taking land... Not taking. I'm sorry. I, I thought it was. But um, as those come in and... I have little doubt that they're going to be far in excess of what's been budgeted. And I believe that's a town expense, taxpayer expense. The feds and the state's not going to, not going to reimburse us for that. And I don't, I don't know this, they don't. I, I doubt they would reimburse us for overruns or contribute to knocking down any cost overruns. I don't know if the feds state. So what I'm saying is when, it, when the budget numbers become clearer, and we find out this is going to cost the town $10 million. Is, is, is there no opportunity to kill this project? We're going to bid in January, as I understand it. Uh, and when we get the bid numbers, then we're going to have some facts, and we'll take those facts and go from there. 
but we budgeted it based on current market conditions and everything else. Uh, yeah, and, and, and that was one of my first thoughts when I got involved uh, with this project, my sister. Um, I, I have never heard a project, I, I cannot believe in business this would ever happen, that a project would be approved, resources would be committed, uh, the whole ball of wax without having any idea how much it costs. I mean, you guys still don't really know the cost. Like when the, when the appraisal comes in for my sister's property, be in the tens of thousands of dollars if she looks at, if the appraiser looks at the delta in fair market value before and after the project. It's going to be ten thousand dollars for her. And we got ninety. Okay. It's going to be a lot of money. The only difference is, in a real land taking, it never goes back to the person. They never own it again. You are taking their property. In this case, the vast majority of these easements are temporary. And temporary means that they have to put back the property mm -hmm. in the condition that it's in when they take it. And it's not a taking. It's a temporary easement to use that person's property. Okay. And it's actually an insurance to the person who accepts or gets a temporary easement that the temporary easement will be put back the way the property is in the first place. Without that, hey, you're on your own. I mean, if, if you don't want a temporary easement. Right, no, I, I but think you, I understand. But it, it is, an, it is, it's like an insurance policy, a temporary easement, in that they must put the property back the way it was when they take it. And okay. it's only for the le length of the project. Well, I, I don't have any knowledge of how much in the permanent, the permanent variety that we're talking about here, like my sister's, even though it's only five inches by 30 feet, I think it's 33 square feet it's not a lot of permanent. It's yeah. 14, it's 15 feet of loss of what you thought was a front yard. So what my feeling is, even though that's only, I don't know, maybe 33 square feet, there's no way an appraisal is gonna be based on the, the real estate value of 33 square feet of property. It's gonna be in, it's gonna be a big number. And I, I don't know how many other people, I imagine, Many, many of the other people on Main Street are going to lose some of what they thought was their property, some of their front. That's going to cost a lot of money. And I'm saying when that happens and when those numbers become known, I mean, what if it's $10 million? Are we ever going to get a chance to vote for it? You just proved we approved the project without any cost. It's not going to be $10 million. Pardon me? Well, I've, I've done easements for gas companies, properties, going through people's property, gas pipelines which is a lot, a lot it's a temporary and they're, they're a lot more dangerous than a construction easement and they were the biggest one that was given out was four grand i just i'm sorry i don't because it's a temporary easement your property has so to go this back this whole thing we're just was. speculating on on what numbers are right here so yeah uh, I mean, it's, it's, but, but you know i think it's i think it's valid to this extent yep any reasonable person could walk in her front yard and say, okay, you can put the street here, yep. the sidewalk's going to be here. Yep. That's going to change your market value uh, markedly. Yep. Uh, and, you know, I don't know how many times we're going to multiply that by, you know, 90. Uh, but you might be looking at a, 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 a new bill, unexpected bill, unexpected cost in the millions. And yeah. conversely, we might be looking at a new unexpected bill of $500. It's all speculation. Okay, all right. You know, so, so that's yeah. Just, that's just crazy. Well, that's crazy talk. All right. So, well, okay. just like millions of dollars is crazy talk. I don't, think I don't so. want to get, I'm not going to go back and forth with you. So. 10 30 at night, I'm all set. We're going to move forward. All right. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. George? is the time of construction, what is going to happen downtown with traffic. We already have a big issues with traffic. The small construction that we had, we noticed downtown business, we had some loss in business because people do not want to come downtown. And my second concern is after project being done, and we lose a lot of parking spaces on the street. 
what's the solution of Parker in their account? So, George, you may have been out uh, when we talked about this earlier, and it's a good question. Uh, specific to your neighborhood, if you will, right here, uh, there's going to be 32 new spaces directly across from uh, the, well, right next to the Muffin House, right behind the Muffin House, 32 new spaces, public parking spaces. It was voted on town meeting this year, approved by town meeting, and funded through the process that we're going to work with the developer to make that happen. Uh, secondly, uh, an additional 36 spaces uh, is going to be constructed behind Town Hall here, um, adjacent to the existing parking lot, but kind of going back in a different direction. So the additional parking there as well. So while this, the street parking may change, we're adding approximately 60 spaces to the right in the center of town, uh, probably around in the same timeline that this other stuff's going on because we've already got funding for those two new parking lots. That happened at town meeting this year. I'm aware of that, but my opinion is that the 36 parking spaces behind the town hall, supporting town hall employees, which is not going to resolve an issue during the day, and 32 parking spaces across the street, they're not going to help the town hall as a municipal parking spaces. They're going to help other businesses around, around, around downtown. So the issue that I personally have, it will still be here. This is what I believe. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. It's going to get worse when we do some street uh, parking. From my perspective, that's my, that's if we're, my concern. I, I hear you, but from my perspective, if we add 60 more spaces in what's already a very tight place, we're going leap years ahead of where we are today. So okay. we'll see in the future. But I doubt it's going to help out. Okay. Thanks, George. <coughs> All right. Moving on. Quickly, Jackie. Yes. Come up. Come up. House. But it's got to be quickly. It's quick. Considering what I've been through with this project, if there's any more changes in front of my house, I want contact. You have my email. You have my phone number. You know how to contact me. My name and number is in front of my house. Yep. I don't want to be surprised. Yep. I don't want to go through what I had to go through again. Okay. And Mr. Kamalu, is there any chance at all that we're going to do any more changes in front of her house? And if there is, can we have a lock solid guarantee that she'll be contacted before those changes are proposed or implemented? Absolutely. We will have to contact you, Jackie. Because yeah. I'm not, I don't want any more surprises. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want you to be surprised anymore. No. No, no. It's not going to be surprising like that. I hear you. Good surprises are good. Yep. That wasn't a good surprise. I'm with you. Okay. Thank you. All right, town manager report. Yes. Um, in the being aware that it's 10:30 at night, Mr. Kamala. Exactly. Town uh, manager report. From yeah. 30,000 feet. Yeah, three sentences. Uh, in in terms of the Main Street corridor project, the MIPA site work was conducted on September 20th, 2019. We are now waiting for comments, the official comments from uh, MIPA. Uh, Historic District Commission has scheduled a hearing on October 10th. Um, in terms of the Pratt Farm Master Plan. Can I ask you a quick question? Mr. Yes, sir. So the Historic District Commission has a meeting on October 10th. Public there's some discussion about 7,000 square feet of the town common being removed. Is that accurate or not? No. It's, it's not accurate. It's not accurate? Okay. We need to make sure that that's very clear. Uh, you know, I saw a letter that was drafted. I don't know if it ever got published in the newspaper or not, specific to a uh, downtown quarter project. Did that letter ever get published? Anybody know? Which one? Um, that was part of the packet of the 38 questions. Because it said in that letter that was going to the, to the newspaper that we were taking 7,000 square feet of land. Yeah, it, it, it was in one of the papers. It was, papers. I didn't see it. Yeah. Yeah. At some point, we might want to respond to that publicly. But anyway. I was at the Historic District Commission. I went as a liaison Tuesday night, and that subject was brought up. And uh, it was stated that, no, there wasn't 7,000 square feet being taken that there is a, a stone wall that the footprint of the common is staying exactly the same as it is. And that there's an old stone wall, and if you notice the front of the common, it, it has, um, <laughs> it's just not flat. It's yeah, expansion. so it's stepped. And beyond that, there's a, a strip of grass that just goes out. That is being taken, some of that, and not even all of that is being taken 
for parking. But the, the original blueprint of the common with the wall and the square foot of the common is supposed to be staying exactly the same. So and they are changing the doughboy a little. They're taking some off the back and adding some to the front. And on the front of the common, they're, they're adding a bump out with some trees. So I can't imagine it. So it, it's not 7,000 square feet. Uh, and if they did, Claire Wright is yeah, they're not our taking watchdog. Well. They're and taking I love the old, having Claire uh, Wright being there. So. Taking the old side, the little uh, okay. curb yeah, and good. The grass. Good. Okay. Yeah, Pratt Farm Master Plan. Um, wanted to update the board. We now have hired a consultant who will help us put together the community supported agriculture. Uh, we've been trying to really uh, motivate the committee to, uh, to participate. I think there's, uh, I can report that uh, there's very minimal uh, activity on the part of the committee. So the bulk of the work on the CA CSA will be done between staff and the consultant. Good. Liaison reports. Well, that was kind of mine. All right, good. <laughs> but there's one other part. Right. There, were, there were the two discussions, and one was that part of the common, in which case there was a lot of objection to even taking that little green space uh, from a couple of people that were actually here tonight. And then uh, they showed what they're going to do. The BAA is going to refurbish their house. Their yep, the PIA building. building. And they showed the plans and the building, and they went over it, and the Commission okayed it, and it Good. really does look wonderful. Good. Brian? Uh, no liaison. John? Yeah, I have, I have a meeting with the, uh, the 2030 uh, chamber tomorrow at uh, the Upper Child so that they were coming in today, and also the 26.2 uh, with uh, um, the BAA that also came in today. So, okay. Our friend? None. Motion to close. No future agenda. Yeah, no future. Okay. What do we have for future agenda items? Mr. Chair, I'd like to put on a future agenda that we get a uh, the, the Lake Maspinock weed situation on our agenda. That we look at any options we may have for a drawdown, that we look at any options we may have for temporary water to that one resident, and that we look at understanding how a resident is drawing water from Lake Maspinock today for potable using water. It for potable water, and we're allowing that to happen. That's a concern for that resident, that family, whatever's in there. And uh, I think we need to try and f you figure that out as part of this overall overall uh, Lake Maspinock weed situation. So I'd like to get that on the agenda. Okay. Okay, anything else? Okay, I will. Uh, Motion to adjourn. Second. Any further discussion? Aye. 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 Opposed, abstain, thank you. Thanks for watching. <laughs>